How's everybody doing? Welcome to Ask an Angler. Uh, we're doing Blue River public hunting and fishing area today. Um, primarily going to talk about trout fishing. It's that time of year, um, but we'll also go over uh, how to catch warm water species in the blue. Um, anybody who fishes down there at all during trout season, you know, it can be pretty busy, um, especially on the weekends or holidays. Uh, it gets pretty crowded. Um, but from a warm water perspective during the summertime, it's usually used more as a camping swimming area and it's not really utilized as much as a fishery during the summer. So we'll go over some of those tips because it's a, it's a really, really great um, bass fishery, smallmouth bass. Um, and spotted bass primarily, and there are some largemouth in there. It's also a great channel cat river, and then you have flatheads and all different types of sunfish, um, and then you can find the occasional non-game fish, some crappie, other things that can come up and down the river during times of high flow, especially in early summer when we've had spring rains, it moves fish up. So um, we'll kind of just kick it off and get right into this. Uh, this is meant to be conversational. So feel free at any point. Um, if you got a question about something, if I'm moving too fast on a subject um, or you just have something to say, use the chat bar and we'll discuss that as we go along. So we don't have a big Q and a session at the end. We'll just kind of answer topics as we go along. This is meant to be conversational. So um, let's get right into the trout fishing. Um, we are now going into January. Uh, we've had about two months now worth of stocking into the river. So there's quite a bit of trout in the river. Um, and there's lots of good public access throughout the you know entirety of the river. We have uh, a road trail system that runs almost the entire length of the uh, public section that we have. So from a convenience perspective of being able to walk the entire river without actually having to get in it um, is a big bonus because it's it's a little over six miles of um, river, which is just, um, it's very unique. We don't have anything else like that in the state where you can kind of traverse the entire area um, without having to go through private land or anything like that. You just have good public access throughout the entire course. So uh, let's jump here into some trout fishing and kind of go through the sections of river um, where you're likely to have the most success, what you kind of need to use to have success, um, times a day, what weather to look for, flow, things like that, that are going to help you just be more successful every time that you're able to get on the river. Um, so let's start at the very North end of the property. So the North end of the property is going to be highway seven, which is a East West highway. Um, we have five parking areas along that section of highway on both the west side and the east side of the river. So there's two parking areas on the northwest side of Highway 7, and then there's one on the immediate southwest side of the road, northeast side and um, southeast side. From a trout perspective, your two best bets for getting into fish quickly um, and kind of being able to spread out and get a lot of water to yourself um, are going to be the northern side of Highway 7. Um, I'll add some links in here into the chat bar uh, for the areas that I'm talking about. So if you're looking at this on a laptop or a home computer, you can pull up another screen. If you're looking at it on your phone, you can go back and look at the chat bar later and pull up these points on the map that I'm going to put up. Um, so I'm going to start with the uh, catch and release zone and how you get up to the catch and release zone. The parking lot for that's a little funky because it's uh, a ways off of the river, whereas the other four parking areas up there on the north end are uh, almost immediately on the river. So this right here, it's listed as the Blue River walking area on Google. Um, but this will get you right to the catch and release. So if you click on that link, it's going to take you to the parking area. And you'll notice on that parking area, you're going to see a big road that comes out of that parking lot. And it's you can tell it's a ways away from the river. And it basically just goes a little to the northeast and wanders all the way up and you would walk that all the way to the end of that trail and as you get to the end of that trail that puts you right in the catch and release zone um the benefit of that is it's a pretty good walk in there by the time you get up there you probably are going to have the river um you know to yourself or pretty close to it 
Um, the only negative to taking that route to go fishing initially is that you can't fish on the way up because you're off the river. So you're basically taking the entire walk just to get to that area to then begin fishing. Whereas all the other stuff we're going to talk about today, you can fish your way through all of those sections to get to better fishing spots along it. So this one, um, I recommend if you can swing it, uh, taking a bike with you, uh, you can ride a bike up that road um, and get up there in you know five minutes as opposed to taking a walk because it's a it's a pretty substantial walk up there. I mean, it's if you're walking, it's going to be anywhere from 15 to 25, 35 minutes, depending on your pace um, and how you know fast you can get up there. And at this time of year, you're probably wearing muck boots, hip boots or waders. So that's a pretty good walk wearing waders. So um, definitely not for the faint of heart um, getting up there. If you're going to make that walk, make sure you got comfortable boots on and, and everything else uh, or else you're going to tear your feet up and not be so happy by the time you get up there. But once you get there, fishing's pretty good. Um, like I said, it's catch and release only up there. So, uh, you know, fish are getting thrown back in the river. Uh, you know, we try fish get pretty evenly spread, um, but you can find some bigger fish up there. They get thrown back in the river um, throughout the course of the three, four months of trout season. So when you do get up there, uh, you know, you're going to have to be mindful of all the special regulations and things like that. Um, and if you're doing catch and release, you know, barbless hooks. So your best bets when you get up there, you're not going to be fishing with bait. If you're going to make the walk up there, you're either going to be fly fishing um, or using some type of, uh, you know, other lures, terminal tackle. Um, and we'll kind of go through what those the best lures to use, but crimping down your barb um, and using the types of lures that we're talking about, almost all of them have rear hooks. So uh, as opposed to using a jig head um, or something like power bait, anything where you're going to get a hook where it's, you know, it can get swallowed. Um, you don't want that, especially in a catch and release area. You want to be using inline spinners, spoons, super dupers, um, things where you're going to have that rear treble hook. So when it gets hit that first time, um, you're typically hooked up, um, but you're hooking that fish right in the front of the mouth. And then with the barbless hooks, it's easy to just pop them right off. Same thing with fly fishing. So some of your best, your best lures that you're going to, um, really are going to work anywhere that you're going trout fishing, not just in Oklahoma, pretty much anywhere you go. Um, these are kind of going to be standard tried and true. Um, but you're going to have more success than if you were throwing, you know, grubs or, uh, you know, spinner baits or hard baits or anything like that. These are, these are really low profile eighth of an ounce and smaller lures, um, that have some flash to them. And they're just, they're really consistent with picking up fish. So I'll show you kind of my favorites, what I use wherever I go. And I don't stray too far from it because you typically one of these colors or one of these bait profiles is going to find fish every time you go if the water and weather conditions are good. So with that, um, here's kind of our first box. We got a little bit of a shine, but basically in here, we got some cast masters and we have some super dupers. Those are just the brand names. Um, essentially what a cast master is, is a shaved piece of solid metal. So unlike a spoon that's concave, this is just shaved. So when it's flat like that, you can see it's kind of shaved off. If you have ever cut like carrots or sausage where you kind of take up the long cut, that's what it looks like. And with these, these are great. They're really solid. Um, you know, you're not getting any water that's going through them. So they get just a nice, really good action. Um, when you throw them out there, there's a couple ways that you can fish these cast masters. Um, and they're, they're so simple. I mean, this is really the most basic of fishing lure, but they're so effective for trout and other species if you use them. Um, but you're just sticking with, you know, really common colors, your golds, bronze, nickel. Um, you might elect for something that maybe has a little bit of flash to it, like a blue or an orange stripe. Orange stripe is really consistent for trout. Um, something that's got like this, where you got your orange stripe on there, um, always pretty consistent, but with these, there's a couple different options. You can jig them, which is you cast it out cross current, maybe even a little upstream. Um, and you let it fall down to the bottom and pick your slack up. And all you're doing is going from, um, you know, your rod tip is rod decks parallel with the ground. So three o'clock, nine o'clock, whatever you want to call it 
up to 12 o'clock. And it's just a real quick jig up. And what that's going to do is it will flutter it up and it falls back down. I'm not a huge fan of fishing them that way because when you're getting that drop, you can get a lot of bites with that slack and they'll hit it. There's no tension. They know immediately by biting at it that it's not real because it's hard metal. So you lose that opportunity where the fish just isn't going to hold onto it. So I've found these to be more effective in still water and in moving water. Um, if you just cast them out and depending on depth now in blue river, blue river is not very deep. Um, the water does not flow through there very fast, even at, you know, some of the higher water conditions that isn't considered flooded or blown out. Um, you're, the water's just never going to be moving quick enough through there. So anything more than an eighth of an ounce is too much because you're going to get down on the bottom. And the um, the makeup of that river is basically shoal bottom. So it's all braided water that hits to a waterfall and then it falls over and then it goes through a next section and then it falls over. And in between that, you're going to have a little bit of soft bottom but for the most part, it's sitting on top of these shoals and you've got some silt that sits on top of that. There's holes in them. Uh, you can get some vegetation growth and then there's boulders. So the problem is, is that if you're trying to navigate a cast and work it in between boulders or anything else, the farther that these things get down on the bottom, the more likelihood that, you know, that treble hook's going to find something and you're not getting your lure back. So really what you're trying to do is just cross current maybe all the way up to 45 degrees upstream, just depending on how quickly you want to work it. And you really just, you just need tension to the end of these. And all it is, is just a slow and steady retrieve, whatever you could, as slow as you can go without it hitting the bottom. Um, and that's going to pick up fish. And that's just super simple. These are, you know, a couple of dollars, two or three bucks um, for just one of these. And if you don't get it hung up, these things last forever. As you can see, they're just, you know, there's not much to them. It's hard to knock the paint off of them. Um, you can catch hundreds, thousands of fish on one of these over the course of the lure's lifetime. So these are just really high value lures that you get catch a lot of fish with and get a lot of use out of them. Um, but that's how you fish them. Now, if you want to jig them and pop them up, um, you can go. If you go to wildlifedepartment.com, check out our fishing resources page um, and look at our learn to fish videos. We have split out in species section in the trout section. Um, there's some videos on how to fish these jigging them. Um, and you can look at those. Otherwise I recommend just casting them out as slow as you can go without hitting the bottom. And all this thing does is it just wobbles like crazy. And it just looks like a little scared bait fish that's running across nice, good flash. Um, and you just want to work them through seams where your waterfalls come down. Um, any of the braided water that's up there. So in that catch and release zone, when you get to it, there's pretty good pocket water that's through there. So you get these quick little runs where those fish want to stack up right on the seam line. So if you have a boulder um, or you watch where the current comes off of the waterfall, you're going to see where the slack's at and where that fast water is. And you want to be somewhere just in between that and just working these down and along those edges and you'll pick up fish. Um, left and right. Um, especially if it's, you know, clear, clear day, um, and there's not a lot of pressure around you and you can find those little holes and be the first person there. You know, these fish can't move around a whole lot just because there's natural barriers. So without flooding throughout the winter, they really can't move that far. Um, and you'll, if you've ever been to blue river or you check it out on Google map and you can look at the aerial and you'll see our roads that run along the side of the river. Well, that's where hauling trucks go with the fish that get stocked. So when you're at the river and you're looking for a place to fish, um, you know, no matter what section of river it is, look at where a truck can get in. Um, so when, where those, the, where those, those little turnouts where that road goes down and you'll see just kind of an opening that gets up against the river where you could see a truck could fit to it. That's where those fish are going in all the way up the river. Um, so in some of that pocket water, the braided water that's off of the road or, you know, on the other side of some braids, unless there's connector channels that go through and we haven't had any high water, you're not going to find fish in those areas. So locating trout, the easiest way to find fish the quickest is just to go where all those little dumpings are because that's where fish are getting stocked and then go from there. Um, but up in that catch and release zone using that Northwest parking area, walking all the way to the end, there's not a whole lot of accessible river up there. Um, 
from a bank perspective. So if you are going to make the trek up there, probably best if you have waders on just so you can get in the water, open up a few more opportunities to be able to find fish. Um, if you're just looking to go and not get wet or put muck boots on or hip boots on where you're not willing to get more than, you know, above your knees, your options are going to be limited to um, some of the waterfall areas and the low water crossing down by the campground. Um, but if you have waders, you can fish the entire river um, during the winter uh, because you can move in between those braids. So uh, some other good lures to use. Um Inline spinners, obviously, are pretty tried and true. Um, fairly natural colors. I'm a big fan of um, olive greens, greens and browns. Um, they're usually called like copper frog. Lots of different bait companies make inline spinners. Bass Pro and Cabela's have their own brands. And then you're going to find Wardens, Yakima Bait, um, those are, those are kind of Panther Martin. Those are some of the big ones. Um, they're all built fairly similar. All it is is just a blade. And instead of like a bass spinner bait where you have an offset arm, this blade just rotates around the main shaft of the lure. So when you're casting this out and you're reeling it in with tension, all this blade is doing is just spinning around that, but it's flickering as it's catching that tension. Um, so rooster tail is always a great one. These are super, again, really easy to fish. Casting just a little bit up current or straight cross current. Nice slow retrieve. A little tip on rooster tails to get them going or inline spinners. Because sometimes what will happen is if you have too much flow or you cast too far upstream and you start to go to retrieve it, you should see the tip of your rod. It should be loaded. So what that means is when your rod, when you've cast it out and you're retrieving, your rod tip should have a little bit of a bend in it because there's tension from that blade that's spinning and it needs to be spinning for it to be effective. Um, if it's not spinning, it's, it, it isn't doing what it's intended to do. You're not going to get bit. So a quick way to get that is the second that it hits the water and it's submerged, give a quick hook set. So when you cast out and that's hit the water, right before you go to reel, you've snapped your bail shut. Just give it a quick little pop just like you're setting the hook and you'll feel that blade engage and then you can start reeling. Um, you know, when you throw it up in the air, it hits the wind for whatever reason, you know, sometimes the lure just lands funny in the water and you'll start to retrieve it. And if you don't feel tension, it means that blade's not spinning. So just giving it a quick rod pop when it hits the water will engage that blade. And then if you've cast it upstream, you're going to have to figure out you know, in a couple of casts, how fast you need to retrieve it to keep the blade spinning. Now, if you cross, if you cast cross current, that water is going to catch it. So it's going to keep the blade spinning. And then it's more a matter of how much weight do you want on your rooster tail? I like a one sixteenth ounce, um, all the way up to a one eighth ounce. You start getting into like the one sixth or a quarter ounce. It's a little too big. It's going to get down to the bottom. You're going to have to reel it way too fast. Um, and most of these fish, all of these fish are hatchery rays that go in there, at least from, from the trout perspective. So they're just really not willing to get chase to, you know, a non-easy meal. So the slower your retrieve speed, the more bites you're going to get, the more fish you're ultimately going to catch. If you have to throw something out heavy and in order to keep it off the bottom, you got to burn it back in. You might pick up a fish here or there that reacts to it when it goes in front. But more than likely, if those fish are hunkered down or they're behind structure and they're just waiting for things to come down the seam lines, the slower you're going, the more bites you're going to get. So keeping in that one sixteenth to one eighth ounce is going to be your perfect range. Now, if you need to get down deeper, um, if, if you're fishing, because what happens is, is as your lure gets blown downstream, as you're retrieving it, the more downstream it gets, the more tension and the more water current. And so what it does is it's going to raise that lure up to the surface. Um, you don't want that. You want these rooster tails bottom third to middle of the water table. So if you're fishing in five feet of water, you want it, you know, no more than two and a half feet off the bottom to about eight inches to 12 inches up off the bottom. You want to be right. That's your strike zone. You want to be running it right through that. So if you need to get down deeper, do not upsize your bait. Don't go to a quarter ounce, put split shot about six to 12 inches up above your line. Typically, um, when you're fishing in a river like that, keep your split shot fairly close to your bait. So 
six to eight inches as opposed to farther up to 12. Because what's going to happen is if you find a boulder, you find a twig, you find something like that, the farther that split shot is up your line, the more likely chances when it hits it that it's going to wrap your lure up because you've got more line in between that to get wrapped. So keep it at six inches, eight inches, you're going to be perfectly fine. Um, and adding on split shot, you can use a couple of different types of split shot. You can go with just your basic um, standard kind of, you know, round shape, or you can go with these clam shape ones, um, something like this, where you just cinch that on. Only problem with these, you put these on, you're not getting them back off without cutting your line. Um, so if you want to run, uh, let's see, if you want to run a piece of split shot, you're better off using something that looks more like this, where you have that back end that you can open it with your fingers or with your pliers. That way, when you crimp it down onto the line, if you want to rem remove it because you've moved into shallower water or you want to take it off and put on a bigger piece of split shot, then all you got to do is just open it back up and then you can remove it from the line. So either way, um, but always use split shot. Don't upsize your lure because um, that's just going to drag you down on the bottom and then you're going to have to reel too fast. So piece of split shot when you get into those deeper pools or deeper runs where you just don't feel like you're getting that lure down deep enough. Now, right now, the Blue River is really, really low. Um, and, and I say low, not as you would think of a pond or a lake going down, but low as in the CFS is below 50. Um, we just, we haven't had rain in a while. So that water is barely moving. It's clear. Those fish are going to be relating to structure. They can see you. So on those sunny days, stay away from the water when you're fishing, try to try to fish upstream from you. Um, and you want to try to get your lure down as close to the bottom or close to structure as you can. Um, cause they're going to be able to see you right now as water flows come up, you know, a really good flow through blue river is somewhere between like 80 and hundred CFS where it stays clear. That's going to give you a pretty good current. Um, but at this time of year with the lack of water that we've had, the way that it's fishing, you really want to get down to that bottom third of the water column or really tight to structure, or you want to pick out braided section of water where, uh, you get a little side channel or side braid where it forces water to move through there much quicker. Um, and you'll find fish that will move up into that more oxygen rich flowing water that's coming at them. And then a lot of times you can find fish that are only in six to eight inches of water and they'll be stacked up. You know, a dozen of them will be sitting in an area that's no bigger than, you know, three feet across just because they found that perfect little braid with moving water through it. So that's something to look for. And up in that catch and release zone, you're going to find some of that water before it dumps back into where you get these big, long, deep runs. Those are much better suited for power bait anglers or bait anglers. Anybody using fly, fly fishing equipment or lures, you're going to have the most luck right around those waterfalls and around those braided pocket water where the water is going to move a little bit more and there's more habitat for those fish to find areas that they can hunker down in and wait for food that's floating by um, without exposing themselves to seeing anglers, to seeing birds, things like that. Um, do you prefer, let's see, I'm gonna answer a couple of questions here before we move down into the next section. What test line is best for trout? Um, it depends on you as an angler. So you can go as low as two pound test if you want to. Two pound test on a six and a half to seven foot uh, medium light to light action rod. Um, you're, that rod's going to be what you're going to be playing the fish with, not so much uh, the test. Um, with that low line of test, you're going to be wanting to use a open face spinning reel, not a spin caster, not a bait caster with that two pound test. If you use it, you put it on this, but your standard test that you want to use is probably going to be six or eight pounds. Um, both of those are going to be plenty to hold on to any fish. Eight pounds is a great one for anglers who um, are maybe just starting off, um, aren't as experienced, aren't as confident with the fish. Uh, when you do hook them up, you want to lean towards eight or 10 pounds. If you've been fishing for a while, if you want, or you're the type of person you want to play the fish for a little while, you can start looking at four to six pounds. Um, you don't want to be over 10 and you know, you really don't want to be under four, but you can, you can, you can use 10, you can use two, four to eight is that range that you want to stay in with, with your test. Now, if you're fishing with um, power bait or bait off the bottom, you probably are going to want to, opt for 
eight pound test. Eight pound test is going to be really good. Maybe even up to 10 if you're using it like a, a spin casting rod and reel combo that came with the line on it. Typically that line is somewhere around 10 pounds. That's just fine. Um, and it's going to be monofilament. Now, if you're using cast and retrieve, you probably don't want to use eight pound tests. These lures, especially on these 16 ounce, um, even eight ounce, eight, eight pound test, especially on open face spinning reel has a, has more of an opportunity to jump off of the reel and get those nasty twists, bird nest in your line that everybody hates. So when you're using these lighter lures, one thirty second, one sixteenth, one eight ounce, six pound test and under is really going to cast better. Um, and then you might elect to use fluorocarbon line instead of monofilament. Fluorocarbon sinks, so it's not fighting against you in that current. It's a little bit more invisible to the fish than monofilament. Um, and it has a lot more sensitivity so you can feel everything. There's no, there's very little stretch. So braided line has no stretch, but you don't really use braided line for trout fishing, at least not in the sense of anything that we're talking about. Um, and if you're casting and retrieving monofilament, like I said, it's got just a lit, lot more give to it. So it stretches if it hits something, um, and that can hurt you on the hook set. So I like, you know, my go-to setup is right here. If I'm going to go trout fishing or just river fishing in general for fish anywhere between, but let's just say six pounds and under anything, six pounds and under, I'm perfectly confident. This is a six foot nine rod. Uh, it's a medium light action and it's got an open face spinning reel on it. And it's got six pound fluorocarbon line. Um, this is, this is basically my river rod. I use this for all my bass fishing, any trout fishing, anything like that. Anything where I think that the average size fish is going to be under six pounds. Um, that's what I'm going to use for my setup. But you have a lot of options. But four to four to eight pounds, tried and true. Stick with that. Fluorocarbon or monofilament. Um, CFS. CFS stands for uh, cubic feet per second. So that's how much water is coming down. Um, I will put the link in here. So this is a great resource to use. Um, so this link right here that I just threw in, this is uh, the CFS for Blue River, and it's out of Connerville, which is just north of our public fishing access. So if you're ever looking for flow um, on a river that you're going to fish, if it's not exactly at the site that you're fishing, you want it upstream of where you're fishing. If it's downstream, it does you no good because you can get um, creeks and other runoff that go in that can raise water levels, stain it, anything like that. So you always want to look at CFS, either where you're fishing or above upstream of where you're fishing. Um, and if you look at that link, you're going to see the one that you want to look at is that discharge, the cubic feet per second, which is the second graph down. Um, and it shows the triangles, the little yellow triangles that run through there. That is the average historical data. So at this time of year for those dates, those triangles are indicating what the app, what the typical flow is. So as you can see, we're about, you know, anywhere from five to 10 CFS below what we're typically at at this time of year. So what you're looking, that's fine. Anything that's low just means that the water is going to be clear and the fish are going to be a little bit more finicky, but it doesn't mean you can't catch them. Um, you just, you got to get get away from them. Don't get on top of them. They can see you. So they're typically going to be closer to the bottom or hugging really tight to structure, but it, they're typically just as active. They're just, they're not going to be middle water column. They're probably not going to give a lot of chase across open runs or pools because they're worried about predation, whether it's from, you know, they see us on the bank. They, you know, instinctually think predator or birds, especially when they know that they can be seen from up above that really kind of hunkers them down to the bottom. So CFS is great for looking at rivers before you get there because it tells you one thing is the river blown out. If you see a huge spike. So where we're at right now, average flow is around 45 CFS at this time of year. If it was at 800 CFS, you don't go fishing. That means that, you know, you're way above what average flow is. That means the river's blown. And the one thing that will ruin trout fishing is high dirty water especially with these stalker fish that get put in they only survive for about six months in there um, before water levels and oxygen levels get to the point that they can't survive um so you, that's looking at the cfs especially if you're going to make a trip um and call the game warden uh you can go onto our website hit it hit our contact button at the bottom and you can type in um 
either Johnston County, and that'll give you the game wardens, as well as our biologists that are down there. You can also type in Blue River. Um, so calling our fisheries biologist or our um, technicians that are down there or the game warden, they can let you know. Because the one thing you don't you don't want to do, if you're going to make a two, three hour drive to go fishing anywhere, you don't want to show up to the river and the river's blown. There's just, there's nothing you're going to be able to do with it. So looking at CFS before you get out there um, is really beneficial. It just helps you know that Hey, river's not blown. It's not stained. So low, not a problem. Um, you can always make do with low water. At least it means it's clear. So um, that's kind of your CFS deal. Uh, what is braided water? So when I'm talking about braided water, the way that Blue River runs, so our little bit over six miles of river that we have is a very good mixture of this braided water, pocket water that goes back into runs. So what I'm talking about is if you look at uh, the first link that I put on there uh, and you look at the river from the overhead view, you're going to see that it splits from one primary river channel where that means the water goes from one bank to another bank with no, nothing impeding through the middle and blue river because of the way it's topography and it's uh, bottom structure with the waterfalls. What it does is it moves through there and it gets to certain sections and the river, instead of becoming one channel that goes over a waterfall, there's all of these islands, island sections. I wouldn't even call them islands because they're more like fingers. They're these big, long sections of earth that dissect the water that's split out through it. Um, because it's hard bottom with those shoals, it can't continue to dig out the bottom. So it digs out the dirt when that water flows through, which creates all of these braids. Whereas if you were to look at any of our prairie streams, the Washita, the Canadian, um, you know, you might get one braid that will come away on a big bend, but for the most part, it's bank to bank. And that's your main channel that comes through. So on the Blue River, what's great about this pocket water is it really concentrates fish into certain areas. The big long run sections where it is bank to bank of water with nothing in between, that's all the channel between two waterfalls, that's tougher fishing for anybody who's not using bait because those fish are going to spread out and they're going to use their senses to come in and find bait. Um, if you're using lures or fly fishing equipment, you want to get right on top of concentrated fish. So those braided areas where the river channel might have five, six channels between the, the primary banks, there could be four or five islands in between where they cut through these braids. Um, and it just makes for a really cool wading experience, both summer and winter. Um, the water is not high enough that, that if you're wearing chest waders, you're fine. You're going to be able to wade the entire river through all of that braided and pocket water. Um, but that's what we're talking about. Braid, braided out water where it goes and it, it finds its way. And there's multiple channels on the different sides of these little finger islands that cut through there. Um, and at this time of year with the low flow, if you can find a waterfall dump out somewhere where there might just be a side channel, but you can tell that the water, you can see it moving through that. Odds are a lot of those fish are going to move over into that running water and stack up into that because current not only gives them a food chain, you know, it's like a supply line that's coming down. It's conveyor belt of food. Um, it also provides cover when they have that running water over the top of them. It's a lot harder for predators above to see down in the water to get them. So they also kind of feel safer in that faster moving water. Um, but anytime, you know, regardless of, of how you fish, um, even what species you're fishing for, when you're fishing in river current is your friend. Um, you want to find where that current is at and that's where your fish are going to stack up. And the braided water on blue is typically a very easy physical identifier to be able to find concentrated fish. Um, let's see. Uh, fishing. Yeah. So you can, so we're down to the last question now in the chat bar. So can you use regular fishing for trout? Yep. Absolutely. That's, that's primarily what we're talking about is using regular equipment, spinning equipment, bait casting equipment, spin casting equipment. Um, those are, this is, that's all what we're talking about. That's going to be your easiest way to catch trout. Um, even, even on blue river. Now, if you're fly fishing on the mountain fork or the lower Illinois, there might be a give and take where you can outfish some of this stuff on a fly rod. Blue river odds are, a little bit against you, mainly because of casting. Um, you need to be a really good caster on Blue River with a fly rod. Uh, roll casting, 
you just you don't have a lot of backs casting areas because of those braided water and side channels. Um, so from a fly fishing perspective outside of right there at the low water crossing where you got a big back area, most of the river doesn't give you a whole lot unless you're willing to walk out onto those waterfalls to make some casts. Um, and at that point, all of the lures that we're talking about are going to be as effective, if not more effective than any fly equipment you can use. But if you are going to use fly fishing equipment on the Blue River, uh, your best friend are going to be woolly buggers, um, any type of stripping fly that's going to be in an olive brown, maybe black or white, but your olives and browns, um, chocolates, changer bugs. Um, those are really, really good. Uh, if you go to wildlifedepartment.com, check out our fishing resources page. Uh, I'll actually put the link in here for our, uh, trout angler guide. The trout angler guide in there, I list off all of the fly fishing equipment um, that you can look at for bugs and and different flies to use that that are useful. But for the most part, in this, uh, we're just talking about equipment for for more traditional tackle and then bait fishing. Um, so here is the link to the trout angler guide. This is this covers most of what we're talking about here, but it covers all of our bodies of water in the state. Um, and if you forget something that I said here, the name of a lure, something like that, you're going to find it in that trout ang angler guide. Uh, is there a stocking schedule when you feel the best time of year for trout fish in the blue? Um, so the river is stocked every two weeks. We don't have a stocking schedule because we don't ever know the exact date. Um, we third, we contract the fish out. So they're not from ODWC We're they're contracted, um, with a fish farm. So it's up to them. There's lots of things that can happen to, you know, miss it by a day where they have to stock a day earlier or later. It could be weather, it could be equipment, it could be trucks, anything can hold up stocking. So we don't put out an exact date because we don't really know until the day of or the day before, but it's every two weeks gets the same amount of fish. Those fish are evenly stocked throughout the entire area. So they don't just go into one spot and you expect them to spread out. They're stocked. Like I said, if you walk all those roads, um, or trails that run right along the riverbank, you're going to see the areas where a truck can back up and where fish can get thrown in. Um, but with all of our seasonal trout fisheries, um, so every fishery that has trout except for the lower Illinois and Mountain Fork, the best trout fishing, it, we're, we're not there yet. We're just starting to get there. It's going to be January, February, early March. Um, partly because of water temperatures and partly because there was no trout before November. So every two weeks, more fish per acre are going to be in the body of water. So more opportunity, um, more bites, just you got more fish. So typically trout fishing in the seasonal, you're going to have your best success middle of January to the beginning of March um, is, is the best time to go. But you can catch fish from November 1, you know, till now without, if you know where to go, where those fish are concentrated at, um, you're going to be able to find them. Uh, will you post where we can access that? Yeah. So everybody who got this email, um, with this link, there's another link in that that's to our archive. Um, if you don't have that email again, you can go to wildlifedepartment.com, go to our fishing resources section, click on ask an angler and all of our, uh, all of these sessions that we've done are recorded and they're on there. You can also just go to our YouTube channel and click on the ask an angler playlist and they're all in there in order from how we've done them. Uh, Edgar. Any suggestions where to fish and going to a meeting prior to that? I fish the Blue River when I stay in Sulphur. I'm from Georgia. Uh, yeah, so fish fishing in middle of March and prior, or are you fishing the Blue River? Um, if you're fishing the Blue River in March, you can get into some smallmouth. Um, and the best, really the best section probably at that time of year is the section just above the campground. So Desperado Springs, you'll see it on the map. That's all that pocket water through there. That's, that's my favorite section of river. And we'll, we'll work our way to that as we go through this. Um, but that's, that's where I would go in March for sure. Uh, fish going to die after why catch and release section. Just it's, it's just an opportunity for mainly for fly anglers to be able to have a place on the river um, where they can go and catch fish without, you know, power bait or other anglers who are ripping fish out. So we just provide a little section of river 
um, mainly for fly fishing anglers uh, to have an opportunity to be able to catch fish without us worrying about our, you know, how many fish are in there. We know that they stay, but with catch and release. So that's just, just an extra opportunity. Um, and then once the fish die, Blue River, healthy population of bass and catfish. So the fish go to good use when the season's over with. They're eaten by other fish that live in the water. So uh, your smallmouth bass, flathead catfish, they're getting a healthy supply of calorie-rich trout come April and May. Uh, so when we talk about fishing for them, uh, some of the warm water species later on, uh, we'll talk about how that kind of comes into play. All right. So that brings us up, I think, to all the questions that we've got thus far. So uh, we're going to move down the river now. So we started out the catch and release. So I'm going to throw up the next link in here to the section of river. Uh, and this one, again, I talked about if you go to that catch and release area, you can take a bike. You can also take a bike over here, which is great. Um, so this section of river. So this is the northeast parking area. It's going to be right on the east side of the Highway 7 bridge on the north side of the road. Uh, this is a great area to get away from some of the crowds. Uh, a lot of people just kind of gravitate towards the camping area and low water crossing to fish. Uh, you're, you're going to see less anglers up on the northern end of the property. So this parking area right here on that eastern side, uh, there is one waterfall complex that comes in pretty much right out of the parking area. That can be a pretty good spot. It's a, it's a good place to go, uh, pretty family friendly, lots of good bank access. You don't necessarily need to get in the water there. So this is your first real good spot on the river to, to bait fish. If you're going to fish with power bait, eggs, um, you know, any other type of scented natural or artificial bait, kernels of corn, uh, worms, anything like that. That first waterfall, that's a great area right there that you can get down to the bank um, and fish without having to get out in the water. You can also walk the waterfall just in muck boots or hip boots on that and then get out on the waterfall right there. So that's a pretty easy access. If you follow the trail on the road and you take it all the way up to the end, it kind of twists and turns. It'll, it'll be right on the river and then it'll kind of bounce off the river. You'll notice a few hundred yards up the road after that first waterfall complex, it breaks into some of that braided water. Um, it's not as severe as it is south of Highway 7. So these are pretty good braids for trout. Uh, the water stays fairly deep through it. It doesn't get, um, the, the pockets don't get too condensed like they do farther south. So you still get a pretty good long run after some of the breaks and the falls in there. So that's a really good place to just kind of go in and work those inner braids along the trail. Um, as the, as that road goes up and it kind of turns back to the West, it, it ends, you'll, you can kind of see that that, that little trail gets down and there's almost like a little kind of opening uh, that's down there. And that is pretty much the end of the public section before you hit that catch and release area. Um, and the turnoff right before the end. So if you were to follow the road all the way down to the end, right before you get to the end, there's a little road cut that kicks back to the river. And it kind of is in the midst of a little double waterfall complex with a braid that comes out. That's a really good spot. If you're the first one on, on the water in the morning and you take a bike or you walk down to that little hole and stand out on that point, it's a great, another great spot to go where you don't have to get in the water if you don't want to. Um, there's enough room there that you can back cast for fly fishing. If you wanted to strip um, some streamers or some woolly buggers or other types of um, stripping flies, uh, that's a good spot to do it. Or if you want to use power bait. That's a really good all around spot. You can use all three different forms of fishing, whether you're bait off the bottom, um, using artificial lures, or if you're fly fishing, that's a really good spot. Um, especially as the, as the season wears on and more fish get dumped into that, uh, it almost looks like a little kind of a swimming pool. There's a waterfall that comes in and it makes kind of a circle. Uh, and then it shoots down that side braid. Uh, that can just be a really good area. There can be lots and lots and lots of fish in there come January and February. So that's a really good spot on the north end of the property. I've fished that a lot over, you know, for the past 10 years. That 
when I went trout fishing, when I first started going down the Blue River, that was where I would always take my bike and I'd start there and then I'd fish up into the catch and release zone and then I'd work my way back down. Um, but the little braided pocket area just downstream of that is also very good. Lots of good bank access. Again, if you want to bait fish uh, or you don't want to get in the water, there's some good stretches of river. But you can see that the the main river channel, the, the main flow kind of hugs the bank where the road is. Um, so you have good opportunities to find some moving water and you're going to find fish that get stacked up in there. Now, the one thing on blue river, when it gets low, like it is now is in kind of that braided water where it, it splits out and you get three or four river channels. Um, if there's not a waterfall that it runs into for a while, uh, if it just kind of moves through a braided zone and then it kind of pops out to meet another braid, look for shallow tail outs, look for fast moving water, um, that, you know, shallows relative. So it could be three feet deep if it's coming out of eight feet of water, or it could be eight inches deep coming out of four feet of water. Um, but where that water really starts to kind of suck in and it starts moving pretty quickly, those little shallow tailings in that braided water, a lot, of, you can get a lot of fish that will just stack up, especially if you have a kind of a cut bank on it where they can maybe get underneath a tree if there's some shadow, anything like that. I'll show you guys a couple of good spots that are down by the low water that are that are just like that, where I tend to find a lot of fish, um, especially in lower flow. Um, so let's see, that that pretty much covers that upper section of river. Um, like I said, there there's lots of good opportunity up there to bank fish without getting in the water. Um, now, if you if you are gonna power bait fish, uh, there's you have a couple of different options, but really the easiest way to power bait fish is get yourself some uh, pre-made snelled leader line hooks. So they're gonna look something like this. Now, if you're down at Blue River, what's great is if you can't get to a store that sells you know, trout gear, which is pretty much your major retailers, Bass Pro, Cabela's. Um, you might be able to find them at some Walmarts, Academies, Atwoods. Um, but for the most part, finding hooks that are small enough or especially trout specific uh, deals where you could see something like power bait, they make pre-rigged uh, deals that you can, this is a double, so you can run a salmon egg and a power bait or two salmon eggs or two power bait. Um, and run something like this, or what's even easier than that is just buying snelled hooks. So they already come on a line, little tiny hook, you know, anywhere size eight at the biggest, all the way up to, you know, size 14 hooks, real, real small. So just something like this. This is about an eight inch leader line. They sell them, you know, bigger. You, it, it'll say on the packaging how long the, the leader line is. This is plenty at Blue River because you really don't want to get too far up off the bottom, and especially right now. Those fish are so low. You really want to. This is perfect. So the easiest way to go trout fishing with bait, no matter where you are, if you want to run a um, a bait setup to float up off the bottom is to use a snap swivel. Now, this one is already rigged with a little bit different. It's just got it's got a Lindy rig swivel on it. So instead of having a snap swivel, it's just got this little twist right there and it's just using gravity and a little piece of wire that holds over there to hold the, the snell hook on so you can pop it right off. But why I like a snap swivel instead of either a barrel swivel or something like this is that you can change out your weight, which is important in moving water because you, if you fish, up and down the river, you're going to find areas of different depth and different flow, which is going to affect how you hold on to the bottom. So in one area, an eighth ounce weight might be plenty to hold the bottom, but in another area, you might have to go all the way up to, you know, a three eighths, a quarter ounce, something like that. Um, and instead of having to cut your line off and retie on a weight, using a snap swivel is going to cut out all of that. So I like the, your, your snelled pre-leader hooks, you already have them. They're ready to go. And then all you need is a snap swivel and some casting weights. So 
we'll just use a big casting weight so that we can see it. So this is a, this is going to be a, a quarter ounce casting weight, I believe. Yeah. This is a quarter ounce. Um, and then, so here's just a little box that's got some, some casting weights, some split shot, some swivels, some really small hooks, some bobbers. Um, and what you're going to do is you just take your main line and everything goes on that snap swivel. So you take your main line, whatever type of knot you like to tie, whether it be a improved clinch, trialing knot, orbis knot, uh, palomar knot. I like palomar knot. Nice and simple when you can bend the line over and get it through your eye hole. So all you're going to do is you're going to take your main line and you're going to tie on your snap swivel. So get your snap swivel tied on there. And then we're going to get our knot tied, cut off the excess tag end. So you got your little tag right there. You can cut that off. You don't have to get super close, uh, super close to it because it's not a part of the bait or anything. So give yourself just a little, little notch, just in case you didn't tie your knot. If it's not quite cinched, that first fish you get, when it gets that tension, it'll really tighten it for you. But then you open up your snap swivel. So we have our snap swivel open. Now it's easy because we can switch out our weight whenever we want to. So we take our casting weight, slide it right on like that. And then we're going to take our snelled leader line prepackaged hook, slide that on there. And then we're going to close it. Now, if there is a knock to this setup at all, the longer your leader line is, because with this leader line, this is pretty stout. This is going to be, this is like 12 plus pound test. This might be 14 pound test. So this is a pretty heavy test. Well, this is only six pound test. So we got a really heavy leader and fairly light, you know, we're at least double. So the only real thing that can happen that's kind of a negative with this, if your main line is substantially different than your leader line, is you might get the occasional twist when you go to retrieve it. But when you go to cast it, it's just going to hang like this. You're going to put your power bait on. And when you go and you cast it out, what you're looking to do is if you cannot get out on one of those waterfalls to cast straight downstream, what you are looking for is a little bit downstream of those waterfalls or if you're just in a very, you know, just a run, there's no waterfall. It's just deep water. It's all moving at the same pace and you want to toss your bait out into that. Um, but the ideal areas that you're looking for to bait fish are where you're going to get back eddies. So preferably where waterfalls come in, whatever side the current really favors. So, you know, you can see your, that line going, you want to be just on the inside of that current break. So you ideally want to be casting about 45 degrees downstream let it sink down to the bottom and then shut your bail and then allow for the current to move your weight until your line until you can hold your line like this no slack no nothing you're holding the bottom your line's not moving um and that's going to require this weight to be heavy enough uh it's going to work down until there's no more current hitting your main line forcing any bow or bend into it so ideally you want to stand out on those waterfalls you can even take a chair out onto those as long as you don't get up water's not really moving and it might be low enough now where there's not even enough water to move your chair if you stood up from it but you just take a little folding camp chair set it out on one of those waterfalls sit down you can cast straight downstream easy peasy you don't have to worry about any type of current action it's going to fall down to the bottom however much line you threw out is how much line is going to be out there now, if you're playing cross current where you're on the bank and you're perpendicular with the current, then you're going to be casting straight out into the middle, wherever that seam is at, letting it fall down to the bottom. And that's why you want to keep the back eddy or the, the lesser of the flow on your side, because you don't want that current just pounding into your main line. You're never going to be able to indicate any type of bites or anything like that. But with this, you fish one hole, you move up to another hole. Okay. It's, you know, I can hold the bottom really easy. This is way too much weight. You only want to use just enough weight to hold you on the bottom. No more. Um, if you can hold the bottom with an eighth ounce weight, don't use a half ounce weight. The more weight that's on there, when those fish come up, and especially if they grab all of it, trout have a tendency to peck. So what you're going to feel is a pretty prototypical when you get a bite from a trout on bait, 
you're gonna have you're either gonna be holding on to your rod, it's gonna be propped up against something, or it's gonna be in a rod holder. But you're gonna get this print. This is what your bite's gonna look like. You're gonna get that very bam, 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 bam. They're just pecking at it, pecking at it, pecking at it, trying to get it into the back of their mouth. Well, the heavier your weight is, if it's not consistent with the amount of food you've put out there or the flow or anything like that, those fish are going to feel that tension when they start to swim away. They'll feel, you know, that weight's pulling that hook down. They'll spit that power bait out before you get a chance. So just use enough weight to hold the bottom. That's why using the snap swivel is great because if you don't have enough, you just open it up, put on that new weight, uh, and then you change your sizes and you never have to retie throughout the course of the day. Um, and these casting weights at Blue River, it, it just depends on where you are on the river. You might find a hole in one of the shoals. You're not getting your bait back. If you drop one of these down into one of those, you know, holes in those shoals across, it's going to get snagged. So trying to look for areas where you kind of have sandy bottom with boulders as opposed to where you can really see that rocky bottom, um, putting it in those areas just so you don't get hung up. Um, but this, this right here is the perfect setup for Blue River, eight inches, especially right now, because those fish are just hunkering down on the bottom with low flow. Uh, but there are some other options to use power bait. You don't have to just use the snap swivel. Um, you, can tie, you can tie a very small hook on and put your casting weight on first. So with this, uh, if you're not going to use a snap swivel, you can use a couple of different weight options. You can use your casting weight. You could use more of like a bottom bouncing weight, something that looks like this. You could use a no roll sinker. Um, casting weights are just what I've always used. They work pretty well. They don't get hung up that often. They're just pretty good for using trout. But you don't have to use a snap swivel. You can just put this right on your main line before you've tied a hook on. Um, and then you can either tie on a very small treble hook, something got some light up there, but you know, less than your fingernail, size 14, size 16, size 18 treble hooks, really, really small, or a very, very small, kind of like an octopus hook, just something like that. Again, no bigger than size eight, all the way up to size 16. So you could just tie on directly, or if you still wanted to use your pre-leader lines, this is kind of a fly fishing trick. How you attach a, how do you attach your leader um, to your main fly line? So what you would do is on your main line right here, double it over, and then just tie an overhand knot. So just bring it back through the loop, creating a loop. Just like that. And then cut off that excess line. And then take your snell. And what you're going to do is you're going to run your main line loop through this loop. So you want to run it. Try to put this on the black so you can see. Run that right through there until you've brought that loop above your knot. So there's the knot right there. Now this is just free on the line. Take the hook and run the hook back through the loop. So underside of this loop, just bring that through. Now they're attached. So you could have either tied on your hook to your main line or done this if you don't have any small hooks. If the only small hooks you have are on a leader line, don't cut the leader off of it. You can just do this. Perfectly strong is going to hold it. So our casting weight is now free flowing, which isn't good. We don't want it to do that. We want to hold it in a fixed place. So now you get to determine how long you want to, or how far off the bottom you want to be because your bait is going to float up off the bottom if you're using power bait. Now, if you're using kernels of corn or worms, that's going to stay down on the bottom. But if you're using any type of floating bait, power bait or salmon eggs, something like this, these float. So what we would do is we're going to take our piece of split shot. And now it doesn't really matter the size of the split shot at this point because it's not for weight. It's just to hold your casting weight from moving up and down the line. So 
whatever uh, whatever is just big enough where you know the whole the eye hole of your casting weight can't go over the top of it. So all right, so we got our eight inch deal. So I got about another eight inches right here. So now I'm sitting at about 14, 16 inches. Uh, if you wanted to do that, or you can go all the way down. Anyways, you can put your uh, piece of split shot on there. Now, once you get it set to what the distance you want for this to float up off the bottom, take pliers or forceps or something and make sure that you pinch that down real good so it's not moving up and down the line or that's going to affect your depth. But now, same exact setup as we had before, just a different method. So while the other one gives you the opportunity to change your depth by adding or subtracting your casting weight with the swivel, this gives you an easier option without having to recut to adjust how your depth off the bottom. So both have great pluses, and but neither has the same benefit. Um, so if you're going to use, if you're going to do it this way with using a piece of split shot, this is beneficial for if you want to adjust your depth. Let's say you know what your casting weight is going to be. You know how to, you have the right size hook and you have the right size weight. If you know that, then this is the way to go because now you just have to adjust depth. But like I said, at Blue River at this time of year, um, eight inches off the bottom is plenty. So using the snap swivel is just an easier way to go about it because you're rigged up, ready to go. You can leave it on your rod, throw it in your vehicle, and you don't have to do It's very low maintenance trout fishing. Um, so let's just do a quick little power bait tutorial here, um, and show you how to put power bait onto a hook like this. So this is just a, you know, a straight little, just a little hook, you know, it's not a treble hook. So you're going to have to work the bait on there. These are, um, this is my favorite power bait, purple nymph flavored, it's got a little bit of black flake in it. I don't really know if there's a big difference in power bait. I've used them all over the years. Never had more success than others. I just started favoring this a long time ago, and that's just what I stick with. So you want to put your power bait onto this. We're just going to create a teardrop around it. You don't want too much bait. So really just a finger, tip of your finger is enough. So just like that, not too much. Just enough that... You're going to put it up against one side of the hook like this. So you can see the, you can see the hook kind of smashed in there. You're just going to work it around just like Play-Doh into a ball around the hook. So just make a little teardrop shape. You want just enough to cover the hook. You don't want too much on there where it's a huge big blob because um, you still have to be able to set the hook back through the power bait. But it goes on just like that. They sell things like these where you can scoop your power bait into these deals and then cramp, clip them around to form a ball. That's great if you're going to attach them to, you know, a like a treble hook, if you wanted to work around that. I don't have any problem doing it just with the finger and balling it, shaping it around, but there are these different options to be able to get your bait on there. Um, so... You could run a rig like that, or if you didn't want to use power bait, you could use, you know, one of these little salmon eggs and same deal. You're just going to, um, it's going to take out one of these eggs and you'll notice on them that on one end, there's kind of a little notch that comes out like that almost looks like a little bobber. That's just because they're all attached in there the way that they were produced when you clip them. So what I like to do is I'll go up through one of those sides where there's the either the little depression hole or the little notch knob on the top. Just get, just lets me know that I'm dead centered on the bait. Um, and then you can just put it on the hook just like that. With these, I like to use a little bit smaller hook. So if I'm going to run a trout egg or a salmon egg, I typically will be running a double on it um, where I'll have the treble hook split coming off. So I'll have two different options. One will have power bait, one will have an egg. Very rarely do that. Like I said, they come in pre-rigged packages if you want to do something like that. So you don't have to do a whole bunch of tying to make this big leader apparatus, but it is an option um, to use, but that's pretty simple. I mean, if you want to just go out and flat out, just catch fish 
and be very low maintenance. Let's say you got kids or um, any type of, uh, you know, physical where you don't, you, you just, you can't walk or you're physically confined. You just want to find a nice little spot along the side of the river, cast out your bait, catch your fish. It, you're not going to beat this. Just good old fashioned power bait comes in a bunch of different colors and flavors but it's all the same bait i mean it's all the same consistency you rig it the same exact way it doesn't matter the color it all goes on the same way this is your fastest easiest way to just get on the water be fishing and very little adjustments have to be made throughout the course of the day with something like that the only real thing you're going to pay attention to in those first five minutes are is your weight strong enough to hold the bottom um and are you at the right depth off? You know, are you are the fish lower or are they higher in the water column? That's all you got to figure out with power bait fishing. So pretty simple, keeps it really, real nice and easy. Um, and that's going to work for you anywhere along the course of the river. Um, let's look at some questions real quick and then we will move farther south. We'll go south of Highway 7, which is really my favorite stretch of the river for trout fishing outside of that one little spot that I showed. Um, or talked about that was up on the east side of the river below the catch and release zone, um, the second turnoff before you get to the end of that road. That's my favorite spot above Highway 7. Um, you always, I've never seen another person there when I fished it, um, just because it's it's a ways up there. So you take a bike, you're there in five minutes, two minutes, three minutes, depending on how fast you want to pedal. If you want to walk it, it's a 15, 20 minute walk to get up there. Um, all right, so... Fishing for trout with bait and weights like you're showing, can you have multiple? No. Uh, trout fishing during any trout, one rod. No more than one rod. Um, that's standard across the board, all of our fishing areas. Um, yeah. Is power bait more about the color or flavor? You know, it's, it's going to be both. But honestly, these are hatchery-raised, pellet-fed fish. So... Is it going to, they really don't live in the river long enough, especially in Blue River where it's seasonal. You might see some adjustments made by fish in the lower Mountain Fork or lower Illinois, just because at some point we have wild fish in there. We have fish that have been in the river for long enough that they're no longer thinking hatchery pellets. And then you have fish that are naturally born in those rivers that are true, you know, wild fish. So then does the color or scent or things like that, can that affect those fish? Yeah, probably. Um, but at Blue River in our other seasonal trout fisheries, clear water, if you're using something that's bright, well, they're going to be able to see it. Um, but does it make much of a difference? I don't know. Like I said, I've used all the colors. I like the, I like the, the traditional rainbow sparkle that Power baits had forever. They used to have one that was labeled Captain America. I think they've changed the name of it. It's just like red, white, and blue now. Um, and now they've really gotten into scenting the bait. So this one is scented like power bait, or uh, sorry, this one scented like uh, salmon eggs. This one is scented like uh, salmon eggs. This one is scented like garlic. This one is scented like nymph. So really, really not much of a difference. Um, uh, yeah, you're limited to one rod per person during trout season. Um, so it, it, at Blue River, you can only have that one rod um, during trout. It doesn't even matter if you're not fishing for trout. You just have that one rod out during trout season. Um, all right, let's go down below Highway 7 now. So from a trout fishing perspective, immediately below Highway 7. So if you were to park south of Highway 7, you're going to want to park on the southwestern side of highway seven. So I'll put a link up for that, where that parking area is at. Let's get this. Okay. So here is the link for the parking area on the Southwest side of highway seven. Now this section of river, you want to park on this side because you can walk down. If you park on the Eastern side, the trail isn't right along the river. It's pretty thick in through there. Um, not as bad during the winter. You don't really worry about ticks or chiggers or poison ivy, anything like that. But it's still pretty rough country trying to get to the river from that east side. So the west side 
you're going to walk on a nice little road. It'll bend you all the way down. And right before you get to the end of where the road ends out, you'll see it kind of dead end at a little waterfall at the end. The waterfall complex up above that, where you'll see kind of a kink in the trail that's up above, kind of off of the river, that little section's a good good little stretch right through there um, for trout fishing. We're going to come back to this here in a little while when we talk about fishing for warm water species, because this is an awesome section um, during warm water. But if you want to fish, you can walk down. There's a little beach area that's right there below the falls. Again, great place to go. Uh, if you just want to not get wet, you want to sit on the bank, don't want to get in the water. This is a great spot on that section of river. Um, now above those waterfalls, you're, there's not going to be a lot of trout mixed in through that. Um, the fish that are stocked up at highway seven can go downstream. Um, but no fish that are below that can get up. That waterfall is even during flooding, they're not getting up and over that one. So, um, you, you, you're pretty much just limited to that little run below those two waterfalls down at the end of that trail. But it's, a, again, it's a, it's an easy bank spot where you can set up chairs. It's not, that's a really good walk. That only takes you a few minutes to walk from the parking area and be fishing. Um, so nice, easy spot. Uh, like I said, all, all the areas up here on the North end are kind of meant to get people spread out. There's not immediate fishing right out of the parking lot for the most part, except on that northeast side, there's one little area. It kind of forces you up into these different sections of river, these little in between the waterfalls, and there's turnouts to be able to access the river from those main road trails, every one of those sections. Um, so up here, you're gonna do a lot more walking um, to find fish because they're gonna, be, they're gonna be concentrated, but they're gonna be concentrated in areas that are pretty spread out from each other. So now as we dip down towards the main area that people associate with Blue River, which is the camping area and the low water crossing, um, we'll get down into that now. And that's where you're going to find the most amount of fish in the least amount of space just because of the way that the river set up down there. So I will put a, we'll do our first link for down there. So we're going to start. We're going to start at the parking area that's up by Desperado Spring. And this is a really cool area. I, I love this part of the river. This is my favorite part of the river, um, both for trout and for warm water species. Um, you can really get away from people because you can kind of disappear in, in all of these little braids in there. Um, and there's also good fishing right along the road all the way to the end. So, this parking area that I just put into the chat bar, um, this is, if you were to pull into the main area and head down to the low water crossing, um, you would go up north as like you're going into the campground, the main camping area that, that a lot of people use during the summer for swimming and everything else. Um, it kicks up up this dirt road. Now, if you drive a little compact car, little sedan, and you're low to the ground, this is going to be a tough place to get to because we get a lot of washout. The road goes straight up. Um, when you turn up it initially, it can get really bad down right there at the turnoff. All that water runs down when we get flooding. Um, so just hit or miss if the road has been graded. So just something to be aware of. If you're going down there in a little vehicle that's low to the ground, um, there is a chance that you might not be able to get up to this parking lot just because the ruts get so deep and you run the risk of bottom, bottoming your car out. But um, trucks, SUVs, no problems. You get right up it. So in this area, what you do is you park up there on the top and there's a little gate. You notice that you're not right on the river, but you can see that the road curls down. And what you're going to do is you're just going to follow that little road down and it's going to kind of fork into a, the, your first Y. You want to stay to the left. You don't want to kind of where it loops and horseshoes back down to the water. You, you can go down there if you want a power bait fish. That's kind of the, it's kind of the end of the pocket water right there. It's where it kind of all tails out and then starts the area through the campgrounds in the low water. Um, so if you just stay on the little horseshoe all the way down to the water, you can set up along the bank and power bait fish that. But if you kind of kick to the left, you'll see the road goes around and it wise again. That's one big loop. You want to stay to the right. 
As you go over to the right, you're going to see a road that kicks out and kind of connects that first little area. That is a really good section of water that comes out of that braided area off of those waterfalls. There's usually really good current through there, no matter the flow. Um, and you can get a lot of fish that'll stack up. Uh, and you'll see when you're actually on the water, the water, there's one side braid that comes right at you. That's real small. It's only maybe three, maybe four feet across and it rips through there. And you can see where there's the last shelf that comes out and it dumps in. There's a couple of logs and things like that where trout will suck up into that. And you can make little casts with lures in through that. Um, or the waterfalls are actually more over to the other side and they kind of, they don't really come in at a north south. It's more of a kind of northeast to southwest and it dumps in. And there's a couple of big boulders that are out there. And those fish, you'll kind of see where there's a shelf and it drops into just a little channel drop. And they will ride that channel drop all the way down that. Um, great area, again, for fishing from the bank without having to get in the water. And it in this portion, this is really your last good spot for power bait fishing um, before we're, we're going into this braided section. Up there, you're sticking to your lures. Super dupers, spoons, cast masters, inline spinner so your rooster tails those are your four primary lures that you're going to want to be using now if you're fly fishing again sticking with woolly buggers streamers something that you can quick strip um, that are in natural colors that can work through there if you're nymph fishing you know you're going to want to run pretty generic nymphs pheasant tails prince nymphs um, the smaller the better size 16 18s um, maybe even 20s uh, odds are you're really not going to get much of dry fly fishing on the Blue River for the most part. If you see fish that are actively rising um, and you happen to be, you know, a pretty heady fly angler that's got a, you know, a fly box that's got quite a bit of stuff in it, you might elect to throw some really, really small um, mayfly imitators for your dries, size 18 and up, 18s, 20s, 22s, um, blue wing olives any type of any mayfly hatch um you might even get away again these are hatchery fish they haven't had a lot of time to see a whole bunch of stuff so you might even get away with like a size 14 to 18 elk hair caddis um but if you do see fish surfacing if you throw out real real small mayfly you know yellow purple bodies um size 18 to 22 you might be able to bring them up on dries um but if you're just nymph fishing standard very standard nymphs um or you might go with a egg pattern or a san juan worm pattern something like that green weenie anything those are always going to pick up fish um but for the people out here casting and retrieving looking for fish uh this is a great section of water so everything that works up above that desperado spring you will notice this is our real braided water um it almost looks like it's just rock that comes through there. You, you really can't make out a defined uh, river channel. Now for trout fishing, leave that, you can pretty much leave that entire section alone. Um, like I said, there's way too many natural barriers in there to find fish. So you wanna go just up above it, it's not much of a walk to get around it. And then you'll come back to where the river is really split by just one main finger in the middle of the river channel that separates two channels. And obviously the channel that's closest to the road is the one where the fish are getting dumped in. So those fish, you know, typically, like I said, they don't, they have natural barriers to get spread out. So they're typically on the braid that's closest to the road. And there's nice, good, long runs all the way up that road. Um, every waterfall that you come to, you know, make a few casts around the structure there. Uh, if there's a boulder, if there's a down log, if there's a cut bank, um, you know, make, five to 20 casts in every single run as you work your way up the river. Um, and then you'll kind of come back into another pretty, not quite as defined uh, braided area, but it gets again, really short runs. So fish don't have a lot of chance to spread out, but as the, as it comes up to make a bend and go back on that loop, there's two waterfalls up there. Those are great waterfalls. Again, it's a, again, pretty good walk. You can take a bike up there. Um, but it's about a 20 minute walk. Uh, if you, if you don't stop to fish, 
to get to the very end where it loops back into the property um, and comes back to the parking area. That's, that's the end right there. Uh, and that, that little section from the end of that to the bottom of the road from the North on highway seven, there's a big bend in the river, big flows to the West cuts back to the South and then comes hard back to the East. And it, it makes a perfect, pretty much horseshoe. That horseshoe is pretty inaccessible in there. Um, we don't have a road. The water's pretty deep. And if you want to bushwhack, it's, I mean, that's pretty native in there. Not a, not a lot. And so during the summertime, typically what I'll do for warm water species is I will, I'll park where I put the link at and I will walk that entire pocket water and fish it all the way up. I'll walk the, I'll stay in the water in board shorts um, or wet water wading pants. And I'll walk the entire, all those braids all the way up to that last waterfall where the road kicks back. And then I'll go back to my truck and I'll drive up to highway seven and then I'll come down off of that southwestern side and walk down to those waterfalls and then fish up through that braided water. Um, and if I have more time than that, if I'm staying for the weekend, then I might go up and fish north of Highway 7 for warm water species. But um, that's kind of that's your stretch in through there. Again, the second that you get past that first little area out of the parking lot where it cuts down to the river. Once you get up above that pocket water, odds are you're not seeing anybody else for the rest of the day, both for trout and during the summer. Um, people just, there's good spots near a parking area. If you're the first one to it, why would you keep walking? Um, but if you, if you like to fish all over the place, if you like to get a lot of bites, catch fish in different areas, it's a great section. The river or the river pretty much stays on the trail the entire way up. So you can fish as you move, which is an added bonus when you're down on the southern side of the property um you're not doing a lot of walking in between fishing um you can pretty much fish all the way to your next spot um all right let's see okay so let's go to our next area so our next area is going to be the most popular spot on the river um which is our low water crossing so i'm just going to send the link to the major park parking area for it. Um, there's a handicap parking just before the low water, um, but I'm not going to link that just so we don't have any confusion about the parking. So there's a big gravel parking area right before the low water. So here is the link to that. So from here, this is a pretty quick little section in here. So if you park in that gravel parking lot and you walk down the road, you can see where the road cuts across that little low water crossing. You got a couple of options right here, depending on how many people are fishing there, how adventurous you want to get, what kind of clothes you're wearing, waders you're wearing, you know, that that's going to all factor into how you want to fish this area. So if you have nothing, if you don't have waders, if you don't have hip boots, if you don't have muck boots, if you plan on just fishing from the bank, your two best areas are going to be to fish right below the low water. Um, there's a handicap accessible kind of platform area with a railing that you can cast from, but below the low, below the low water uh, is a nice little deep run, mixed boulder fields that run through there, kind of turns over, um, and then it's running back towards uh, the camping area that's on the southwestern side of the property. Um, and then you might be able to walk, depending on how much water flow there is, you might be able to get out, um, to fish the section that you just above low water. Um, there's a big run that goes up to a waterfall and then there's another run, um, along the bank that you can walk up. That's on the inside of that, that kind of works its way up to the camping area, but that runs you into really heavy braided pocket water again, um, that's all, all of that is below that Desperado spring. Um, so again, great warm water fishing through there, but to find trout in that, um, can become difficult, but the little run that's just above low water. So let's say you got hip waders or you've got actual waders, you got muck boots on and you can make the low water cross and get to the other side. Um, if you didn't drive over there to park to begin with, uh, the little section that's just above it, you'll see it runs up and it hits a little waterfall. 
that's hit or miss. Um, if you walk it all the way up to just below the waterfall on the, like, it's the southern side, the southeastern side, um, and cast right at the waterfall and all there's, you know, depending on the flow, there can be water coming at you basically 300 or 180 degrees around you. Um, at low flow, it might just be coming right above you, but you want to cast up into that. And again, working all these same lures, or you can throw power bait in there. There's usually a bunch of fish in that. Now, as it, as that run makes its way down towards the low water, that's hit or miss. Sometimes there's a bunch of fish stacked up in that. And you, it's awesome because it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Other times, if it's heavily pressured, I would imagine right now with as low and as clear as it is, not a great place for a fish to be pretty easy picking um, for a bird to get them. So if you were to go across the low water, so now you're on the south side of the water, right where the low water comes back into solid ground, there's a little walking trail and you can stay right on the southern side of the water right there. And it kind of wraps around a corner. Um, and as it wraps around that corner, you'll notice that there's these little kind of braids that come through. Um, and you can't really see it from the Google overhead, but right on the corner as it comes around, you'll see all these rocky outcroppings and you'll see the main channel right in the middle. And then you'll see it kind of falls over, falls back to the west and it's on that side. But on the eastern side of that is one little braid. It's not very deep. It's only about this deep and it rips through there. I always check that spot every time I'm there. Um, whether it's a, you know, inline spinner, spoon, cast master, doesn't matter. For whatever reason, there's lots of good cover. There's a cut bank and it's really shallow and it whips through, but that water is always moving through there. I have found fish stacked into water that's this deep and this wide. I mean, where you're making 15, 20 casts and you're hitting fish every single cast. So that's a really good spot to check. It's hit or miss. Sometimes they're not there, but when they are there, there is a boatload of them that get in there. Now, if you have waders on or hip boots or anything like that, I recommend fishing all of that. You can walk right across it. So if you get hung up, um, if you're using like, you know, bright spoons or bigger, you know, something that you could see if you tag the bottom with it, just cut, you know, snap your line, especially if you're catching fish. Catch as many fish in there as you can. And then it's really shallow. You can walk right across it. Once you stop getting bit and you've snagged or hung up on anything, you can go back and retrieve your lures out of the water. But if you follow that, it cuts back out to the main stream and there's a big, fast boulder section that goes through there. Um, and I would imagine right now at this time of year um, with the way the water is, that's probably a pretty good spot. There's lots of hiding, lots of really good boulders um, that aren't massive boulders. They're, you know, maybe this big around that provide good habitat and hiding and that water moves pretty quick through there. So um, that's a really good spot, you know, all of the time, but I would imagine the way the water is right now, that's probably a really good spot right now. Um, just with the way the, that the water is. So the last section of river that we have is down in the camping area. Um, the southern camping area. Now you can access it from the east side of the low water crossing, or you can locate it from the west side of the south uh, of the low water crossing. It doesn't really matter. I favor the western side just because that's the camping area side that that loops down at the end. Um, so I'm going to put I'm going to put the pin down at the very end of the road where it loops, and then we'll work our way from that back up to the low water. And then we'll uh, talk about warm water fishing and kind of go, I'll go through all the lures for trout um, and then we'll talk about warm water and then take any questions. Um, but if I passed anything, I'll, I'll check the questions here in a second. Um, all right. So here's the link. Here's the final link uh, for our maps. So this is, like I said, this is the loop. Um, I always forget if it's camping area one or two, uh, but anyways, when you when you're coming in the main road, right when you get to where the low water crossing is going to be, you'll the road splits um, and you would you turn right. And so you haven't you turn right before you go over the river. 
um, and you'll follow that. And there's fishing areas all along that. So we'll work our way back up. Um, let's see. No, campsites don't. So to utilize the area um, for camping, for fishing, for hunting, uh, all you need is either a fishing license, a hunting license, or a conservation passport if you are not exempt. So exempt are going to be kids under 16. Um, and then if you have a lifetime license, any, any disability license, anything that would qualify as an exemption to a standard fishing, hunting, conservation passport, that's all you need. Um, and yeah, first come, first serve, no registration, no pay sites. They're all primitive. Uh, there's no running water out there. So um, they're all vault toilets. Um, but for primitive camping, it's the grounds are well maintained and there's a lot of opportunity. So during the winter time, you know, there's a lot of RVs and campers and motorhomes, vans that'll go down there. Um, so usually the other camping areas away from uh, that low water crossing are pretty wide open. And even in the summer, you can spread out. And so this link that I put in, this is this is where I like to camp is down on that loop. Uh, it's usually wide open good place to get firewood um, and kind of get away from the crowds. So from that area, we're going to be talking about going back upstream to the low water. So there's a section of river that runs right through that. That's right below um, that loop. When you're there physically on the ground, right where the loop starts. So where the road wise into the loop, there's actually a trail right there that cuts down to the water and you'll notice kind of a little very little waterfall that dumps into a good long run. It's a good spot if you're camping there. Um, spot to hit in the mornings and the evenings when you're at your campsite and power bait fish right there. You can flip and pitch lures or fly fish. You got some good casting area there. You can either get in the water or you can fish from the bank. Either are an option right there. Then you'll notice as you go up from that, um, there's kind of one braid on the the northern side of the water and then one that cuts through there's little turnoffs all along that road where you can park and you can find fish basically through all of those little runs those are all great runs that that go through there they're set up perfectly where it's waterfall 100 yard run waterfall 100 yard run some boulders some little tail outs some things like that really good habitat so these areas typically hold a lot of trout um, once you get above that next waterfall, you'll notice a pretty good long run that cuts through there. So you probably want to fish it as close to that waterfall. Again, you'll see a kind of a turnout area where you can walk down the rocky outcroppings and, and get down there and fish below the falls or up above it. Um, and then that winds you up to that last little turn and then it gets you back to the low water. Um, so basically the Western side of the river all the way south of Highway 7. So all of our public land south of Highway 7, uh, you're going to be wanting to fish the western bank. Um, that's where the trails are going to be. So if you don't if you don't have waders, you don't have any way to get in the water or even get a little bit wet, um, that's going to be your best spot. Or just above Highway 7 on the eastern side for a quarter mile up, there's some good access. Outside of that, though, you're really you're you're going to it's going to be more advantageous to you to have waders. Um, if you have waders, the entire river is your oyster. But if you have muck boots or uh, hip waders um, or hip boots or anything, you know, just where you can stay dry below the knees, you can fish every single waterfall on the property. Um, the, they're rock, you know, rock from bank to bank. So every single one of those we typically have some type of cut, you know, road cut that goes right to the falls where you can walk up on them. Um, and you're always going to find fish around those because those are where we stock. So those little holes that are right there below all those waterfalls, um, that's where our hauling trucks go and that's where we throw fish into the water. And usually that first couple of days after they get stocked, um, they ain't going very far from where they got thrown in the water. And they take some, you know, several days to weeks to get acclimated to their new surroundings before they really start to branch out and explore. So any, anything that you see that looks like where a truck could back up to the water, odds are they're probably not 
there's not fish too far from that. Um, and every area is different because some of them literally they're dumping fish into what amounts to a swimming pool because it's surrounded on all sides by waterfalls. So they're stocking them into an area where it's basically a pond. Um, that's that area that I talked about north of highway seven on the Eastern side. If you go all the way up there, they, when fish get thrown in there, they can't go anywhere. Um, so if it doesn't get fished too often, or if it's not getting fished by people who are keeping them, you can get a lot of fish in there by the end of the year, um, or by the end of the trout season. So, uh, I'm going to go through all of our trout lures right now. And then we're going to talk about warm water species. So if you got any questions about trout, anything we've covered, um, now's the time to go through that. Um, and I'm going to go through all of our lures to show you that. I've put the trout angler guide link in here. Um, so anybody can go and click on that. You guys can always go to wildlifedepartment.com, go to our fishing resources page. And from there, you're going to find a plethora of information on, you know, everything from trout and blue river to any species and different types of fishing. So if you can't find it in here, you can always just go through our website and get to those articles and things like that. Uh, all right. So can you get a large RV? Here. Yeah. Yep. You can, uh, you can pull just about any type of rig to get in there. Um, some of the spots are tight, so it depends on how confident you are as a, as an RV driver, but I've seen, you know, as big a motor homes as they make all the way down at the end of those loops and at the end of those camping areas. So lots of space there to, to get any type of equipment that you want to get in there. Um, do I prefer a swivel when using lures? No. Uh, for all of these trout lures that I'm going to go through, uh, I tie directly on. The only thing I use a swivel for in trout fishing is my snap swivel to attach on my casting weight and my snell leader line uh, loop. That's the only time that I use a swivel. Um, I very rarely use a swivel for any other type of fishing. Um, I like to have direct contact with my bait. Um, especially with when they're making, you know, your eye holes that are loose, you're getting every bit of action without needing a swivel. Some, you know, some people put on swivels, you get a little extra action out of your crankbait, um, your build baits, things like that. And it's easier to switch them off without retying. But I like to have direct contact with the bait. That's, that's not, that's really not doing anything from a fishing perspective. That's just personal preference. I, I don't have any problem cutting off and tying back on. Um, so I don't use a swivel when I'm using lures. Uh, schedule for stocking trout again, every two weeks. So um, it's going to be pretty much the first and the third week of every month. It, you're getting same amount of trout are going in to blue river as all of our other seasonal trout areas. They're getting stocked every two weeks. Um, lower Mountain Fork in Lower Illinois uh, on typical years usually get stocked once a week um, just because they're year-round trout fisheries. But we don't have exact dates for the trout because we contract the fish. So we don't ever know until right up to when we're getting them if they're actually going to be there that day because there could be any type of breakdown with the truck, weather, anything that could hold up stocking. So every two weeks on that. All right, let's go through all of our trout lures and then we can kick into the warm water species for those of you who want to stick around for that because Blue River does not get fished very much in the summer um, or it's not really the summer. Basically from mid-March to early April, depending on how bad our winter was and how quickly we warm up from there all the way through October, even into early November, again, depending on how quickly we get cold. Uh, it is a world-class wading stream um, for warm water species. So we'll get into that. I love it for warm water, but we'll cover all the trout stuff um, and then we'll get to that. So we pretty much talked about, you know, there's, there's really four or five basic lures that you need to have for trout fishing. All of them work. You're going to favor one over the other, I promise. Um, there are certain ones that I don't prefer to fish that sometimes they catch more fish. I just don't like the way that they fish. Um, so, but we'll go through all of them and I'll kind of share with you which ones I like, how I like to fish them. So let's start with our spoons because we really haven't talked about those yet. So your best trout spoons are gonna, again, be something in between a 16th of an ounce up to an eighth of an ounce or somewhere in between that. 
Um, Little Clio brand spoons, big major brand, uh, or it's Acme, um, and they make Little Clio and they make Castmaster. They've been, you know, making trout lures forever. So very reliable baits, um, but not much to them. Just concave spoon. This is probably my favorite color, orange stripe, either with silver or gold. Doesn't matter. To something like this. These fish, I fish these and cast masters the same exact way. Um, like I said earlier in the presentation, you can go to our website, go to our fishing resources page, look at our learn to fish videos and click on the trout section. And there are videos in there talking about how to jig these um, where you're casting out and you're making a big jig and it's fluttering down. I don't like to fish them that way just because I don't like the slack in the line. Um, and I've found just as much success maintaining contact with them. So with these types of lures, all I'm doing in Blue River is casting straight cross current or all the way up to 45 degrees upstream, depending on flow. If there is little flow, I'm going to cast more upstream. Um, the faster the water, the less effective these are when they're coming with the current because it's not allowing them to get the pressure moving against them, the resistance of the water where it's working through it. And what that does is it just makes it wobble. All it's doing is just wobbling on its side and it just gives off a nice little flash and lures like these with the trebles being on the back without any skirts. So there's no dressing off the back. Whereas like this one has some dressing off the back with these, a fish can come up and they can get it right here before that hook and it'll drive you insane when you're getting hit. So using jig heads or something where there's a lot of the bait profile underneath or behind the hook, when it comes to trout fishing, you can get bit all day, but your hookup success rate is going to be very low. Um, so lots, you'll notice with all these baits that this is about as much behind a hook as you're going to see of any of the stuff I'm going to talk about just because they, when they come up and they can get it. And then other times, if the body profile of the bait is too big, if they try to T-bone it from the side, if there's too much of this behind, you know, in front of the hook, then again, they're doing the exact opposite. They're hitting it up front and they're missing the hook. That's why 16th ounce is just perfect for trout. Eighth ounce is kind of the larger end in Oklahoma. We're not, you know, we don't have 20 pound rainbows and lake trout that were, you know, trolling behind a boat in 80 feet of water using lures that are this big. So um, for if you want to just catch volume where you're going to catch the biggest trout that's in the water all the way to the smallest trout in the water, 16th ounce is your best friend. 32nd ounce if you can swing it, but 16th ounce is perfect. Try to stay no bigger than eighth of an ounce. Um, so these are, here's some different spoons that I have. These are everything I'm going to show you is the stuff I use. Um, so these are all my favorite colors, favorite sizes, use these wherever I go. Um, so for our spoons here, I got about four colors, five colors, um, that I'll use. Typically they're all effective. Um, like I said, sometimes you might just find a little bit more success with the orange stripe or the blue stripe or the red stripe. Um, these ones, these are identical. Same exact lure, same size, just this one's blue stripe, this one's orange stripe. Then we have just our solid gold on both sides. And then we have one that's gold with a red stripe. And then always, I always keep a rainbow trout color in all of these different lures silver backing just like this so those are my five spoons um these are all the same size i don't stray from them if i'm using spoons it's one of these five colors i find success everywhere that i go with these so very reliable hard to beat a spoon um so and they're very like i said easy to fish uh as long as you're just Nice, slow, steady retrieve, casting cross current, just a little bit upstream, just enough to keep it off the bottom. If you're hitting the bottom, not fast enough. Uh, if you don't feel the bottom every now and then, then you might be going a little too fast. You want to just find that happy medium where that pickup, 
the first time you hit the bottom is just a little bit faster to where maybe every now and then you bang into a rock, um, but you're up off the bottom. So those are, those are the colors of spoons that I like. Um, stick with those pretty consistently. Uh, so let's go to our rooster tails or inline spinner. Um, again, Wardens, Panther Martin, Cabela's and uh, Bass Pro each kind of have their own generic brand. Um, and Yakima Bait Co. Those are going to be your five that you're going to find. If you find inline spinners anywhere, you're going to see Wardens, probably going to see Yakima Bait, probably going to see Panther Martin. Um, but if you find, you know, the, these are just the colors you're looking for. They can, there's really not a lot of difference between these lures. There's very subtle differences. How much of a difference they make, I don't know because these are usually pretty successful. So I don't stray too far. These are my two go tos. Um, if I'm going anywhere, this is probably the first thing that I'm throwing because if I can nail them on inline spinners, I don't change up because I love fishing these. I, I like the way they fish. Uh, so this right here is going to be a, uh, 16th ounce. It's called, uh, is it called copper hammered, hammered copper grasshopper is the name on, if you find it for your wardens, um, or any of the generic brands, it's usually, this color is usually labeled as grasshopper. It's basically brown, um, gold flasher. Uh, this is just a straight rooster tail. Just This is as classic as it gets. Um, and then I like for my green color, this is usually called uh, copper frog or hammered copper frog. If it says hammered on it, what that means is that the plate itself, this one doesn't really have it. This one does this is a good one. This is a hammered plate. So you notice that it's got all the indentations on it. All that's providing is a little bit extra vibration in the sonic signature as it's going through the water. So you'll see it labeled as hammered copper frog or hammered grasshopper if it has a hammered plate or its blade. Um, this one is a, it's Warden's Vibric Rooster Tail. So the only difference between this and the brown one is the shape of the body is kind of more of a cone, just a little bit more of a sonic signature. Um, it's kind of like blades, willow blades, Colorado blades, Oklahoma blades. You know, they're all giving off just a little bit different signature in the water. So this one, if there's lots of rooster tails being run through the water, I can still run a rooster tail and it gives off just a little bit different sonic signature where the fish, they can key in on if they're getting pressured by something else. But these two right here, I don't stray far from these. If I can catch trout on these when I get there, I don't change all day. Um, with these... I, all of these pretty much fish the same. I'm looking to cast cross current or upstream and how far upstream is just dependent on how fast that water is moving. When these hit the water, um, you know, I'll give them one, maybe a two count. And then I pop my wrist to make sure that blade's going and then slow and steady right through the water column. Um, and you're going to feel steady tension on your rod tip the entire way in, which is why I love them because I know there's no slack in the line. There's no wobble. I, I always feel contact with the bait the entire way in. And you're just going to have just the slightest bend on your rod tip, but you'll feel the vibration in your reel handle. So you'll know that that blade's spinning. Um, and then again, for all of these, if you need to get deeper in the water column, split shot, six to eight inches above where you tied your knot. So six to eight inches above that eye hole on your main line, about right here. Uh, if you need to get deeper, don't upsize because like I said, these are the perfect bait profile to catch six and seven pound trout and they will catch six and seven inch trout. So you've got the whole don't eliminate fish, which is what I try to do when I go fishing. I typically favor smaller bait profiles because I don't want to eliminate fish. Um, if I'm going to throw a big lure, well, I know that the only thing I can catch is a big fish, um, but you can also catch that same big fish on a 132nd ounce lure. Uh, so don't try not to box yourself into a specific size fish by getting too big. And in Blue River, you're just going to be costing yourself money because you're going to be hanging up on everything along that bottom. Um, so use a piece of split shot. Now, some other rooster tails that you will probably find success on. Um, I don't use these colors a lot because like I said, 
usually one of these two is getting it done everywhere that I go um, to the point where I don't feel like I need to change. I feel like I'm catching enough fish, getting enough bites that I don't change. But your standard whites and blacks, gold plates, copper plates, bronze plates. Um, I'm not big on silver uh, for my blades, but I don't have enough anecdotal evidence for myself to say otherwise. I just know that I've always had success with gold, nickel, bronze. So I don't use silver, but any of these with silver flashers probably are going to accomplish the same thing. Blacks and whites, very tried and true. If you want to get off the beaten path with rooster tails, you can, they make tons of different colors, tons of different setups. Um, here's an inline spinner. That's got more of like a soft hackle nymph type on the back with an inline spinner. So maybe a bright orange or a bright pink or a, you know, rainbow trout colored. You can try any of them. Uh, these are my go-tos right here. So if I'm using rooster tails, that's what I'm sticking with. Um, let's go. Now here's some like more generic inline spinners. These are like Bass Pro brand for the most part. Um, the only difference you'll notice is this is more of kind of a willow blade. So the difference with these is that you're just not getting a lot of vibration coming out of these um, as you will with some of the brand name inline spinners. But again, probably not, doesn't make much of a difference. But as you can see, pretty natural colors throughout there are greens, are browns, yellows, oranges, all very consistent with trout. Um, you start getting into like some wonky colors like pink or purple or blue. Um, you're gonna have to find your own anecdotal uh, success on that. Uh, I just don't use stuff like that. So I don't have a lot of comments on when you get outside of more of the natural color scapes. So our last box here for trout uh, showed this earlier, but here's our super dupers and our cast masters. Um, we kind of talked about the cast masters earlier. Here's a generic Bass Pro model. And then here is an Acme Castmaster. Big difference being shorter, fatter, a lot more action. Slender, not as shaved, not as much action. But again, right colors, fish slow, typically going to find success, uh, especially in moving water. In moving water, something like this is going to get a lot more action than it is if you go to uh, one of our trout lakes or trout ponds. If you're going to one of our ponds or something, use whatever is going to give you the most vibration, which typically is going to be your more name brand lures. Um, the more generic models, just as effective in moving water, I think. Um, but they're, you're not going to have quite as much action with them. Um, but the window dress or the, the skirt dressing on the back is nice. Um, that can make a difference sometimes. Uh, so here's, Here's an, a cast master one that's got a skirt, a little white, something like this. Um, but you'll notice in here, pretty much the same color schemes for my spoons, super dupers, uh, and cast masters. They're all essentially doing the same thing. We're mimicking bait fish with a not really consistent wobble. So your rooster tails create a very consistent signature because you're slow steady blades rotating it's pretty much the same thing you're not stopping it pausing it letting it fall doing anything your spoons your super dupers and your cast masters even on a slow steady retrieve because of the way they're built it's creating an inconsistent erratic motion so if a fish is following it if they follow in a rooster tail for example you're not going to see this today on the Blue River because the water's too low and too clear. So they're not going to chase it all the way across a run. But when the water's a little bit higher and you'll watch trout chase, even, I mean, you can watch panfish and bass do the same thing. They'll, they'll follow it all the way to the bank. They'll stay about a fish length behind it. And it's just because they've watched it the whole time. It's the same signature. It's no, it's consistent the whole way in. They're skeptical. Um, that's why rooster tails are great when you rip them through the seams um, out of that fast water, because then it's just a reactionary bite um, and you get good action on them. But when you're fishing your cast masters, 
and your super dupers and your spoons, you're getting that inconsistent erratic motion. So what happens is, is you're reeling this in the same way, slow, slow and steady, except this is wobbling all over the place. So if you hit a pocket of moving water that's coming through, you hit one of those seams, you run into slack water, you run into faster water, that is going to affect what this thing does. So you might get a fish that tracks it, tracks it, tracks it. You come through a seam line or any, you've changed water, you know, water flow in some way. Well, when it hits that, it, you know, it does something different. It darts, it goes, it changes what it's doing. And that right there is when you come and you get that bite. Um, so super dupers, super dupers are my least favorite to fish. They are very effective. Um, but it is, it's a very weird sensation when you're reeling in a super duper. These are very light. Um, and even your 16 and your eighth ounce ones. So these are meant, they're made to wobble, unlike your spoon that's concave and your cast master, which is shaved. This is actually open in the middle. So it's got a little swivel on it that you attach your main line to. And what this does is it allows water to come in between this when it's being reeled in. So it, again, creates that erratic, inconsistent wobble, depending on where it's going. But with these, because they are so light and they're so dynamic with how water moves through them, they can be real hard to feel sometimes, especially in moving water. You, you know, with these, probably if you've never used them before, put a piece of split shot on to begin with. Um, give yourself a constant piece of weight that's on it so you can maintain contact when you're doing a nice slow steady retrieve. But when you throw these up river and you're working them through, it's just really hard. It, it takes a lot of practice to get consistent with your rod tip to your bait. Um, and these things get drilled. These are so hard to miss. So here, here's kind of our bright color. Um, try to take it out of the glare. There's a couple of spots on it. Chartreuse. Could call it yellow, but it's chartreuse. Um, always a standard color for trout. Chartreuse and, and orange if you're going to go bright and loud. If you're not, if you're going to keep it natural, which is typically what I like to do, these are my favorite, um, these little prism ones. So we got a bunch of different types of them, but they're all really the same. Um, get these separated real quick. So here is, here's my favorite one, if I'm going to use one, which is the bigger size it's called, it's gold, but it's called prism. You notice the, it's got kind of a metallic flasher on it. Um, I had one that, that I've used a lot in the past, and you'll see what happens to them when they get bit a lot and bang up against stuff. These were the same at one time, but you'll notice this one over here that I've used a bunch, that kind of metallic has been scraped off and not quite as much of a prism anymore from bites and rocks and everything else. But this is my go-to super duper, just gold, red, prism, like this one. Um, they make it in a smaller size. So this is just the size down. Um, and then they also make one that doesn't have that prism on it. So it's just flat gold. Uh, these, so the difference being on cloudy days, this is going to give you more of a flash underwater because you're not getting light penetration. On clear bluebird sky days, something that doesn't have that metallic flash, but because it's getting sunlight, it's going to create the same illusion when it's moving because that sunlight's able to hit it. So the prism just gives you an opportunity to get extra flash on sunny days. And on those cloudy days, you're still going to get that same flash through the water. I like the gold ones, but they also make them again, like everything else I, I've gotten here, I keep pretty much the same colors for all of them. So you could go with a rainbow trout, one that they make or you could go with silver so same thing with the silver ones these are identical to the gold ones just silver metallic flash and then ones that don't have them um but like i said if you've never used a super duper before put a piece of split shot on the first time you use it or practice using it in non-moving water um and then you'll get the hang of it but like i said when fish get these ones they don't miss so if you got any type of tension to your odd tip, these just get hammered. You, 
you really almost never miss fish with these. They're just the kind of the perfect profile for a trout's mouth to get sucked in. And you always end up on that rear plate. Um, but that pretty much takes me through everything. You know, here's, here's another one of the shaved with some, one of the cat or one of the generic cast masters. But again, oranges, chartreuse, if it's not just going to be gold, bronze, silver, rainbow trout, or some type of natural color like a green or a brown. So let's look at some questions. Uh, I guess I'll show. Here's, here's a couple of boxes for just terminal. Um, they sell, these are called like the brand is Trout Magnet. Or you'll see them packaged as Trout Magnet but they'll sell these real, real tiny with a little tiny jig head. And what these do is this mimics an inchworm. So if you fly fish, it's a green weenie. Inchworms are all over the world. Um, they're just, they're a very standard bait. So here's one that's a little bit brighter. And then, you know, they sell scented trout worms. So here's our rubber, basically San Juan worm. So with these ones, I'm not big. I'm not big on these ones in Oklahoma. Um, you can catch fish, but it's just a lot. You're adding a lot of unnecessary complications to trying to catch trout. Trout are pretty easy to catch, um, especially with all the stuff we showed. This is just if you want to get a little bit more adventurous and try something new. If you can find these, I, can, I haven't seen them at Bass Pro this year, um, but that's where I got these originally. But these just mimic an inchworm. So the, these are a game changer on days where you can't catch them on anything else, which typically doesn't happen if you're using power bait or spinners, spoons. But if you're fly fishing and you're having a hard time matching the hatch or getting them to go on anything, um, you know, they make you can throw one of these on a fly on fly rod easily. Uh, this is like a one. 196 or something. I mean, it's tiny. It, it weighs nothing. Um, but it actually casts surprisingly well with a, with spinning equipment if you put just a little bobber on it. So what you can do is you just take the smallest size uh, round peg bobber and float this, you know, probably at least a foot below, but, you know, up to like two feet. So tie this on your main line, hook this up, and if you're going to try this, it works and it's fun. This is just, you know, if you're catching a lot of fish or, you know, you just want to try something new, it's a fun way to catch fish. Um, it is challenging. It's actually easier to do on a fly rod. If you hook this up on a fly rod, then you have your floating line. You can put an indicator on. But if you don't, you can do this on like spinning equipment. Make sure that you have monofilament line. Don't do this with fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon sinks. It will not work. Um but what you do is you tie it on, put this up, you know, anywhere from a foot to two feet. Um, anything more than that's going to be too cumbersome to cast. Throw it dead upstream into the current. Um, it works better if you can wade because you really want to be, you really want to be casting straight upstream so you can just pick up your line. But if you have to go across current in any way, try to get up high on the bank um, or high up out of the water and cast into the seam. So where that really fast water is going this way and the slow water is coming right along the side of it, the little bubbles that are in between that, that's what's known as a seam. Or if you have a boulder where you see the, the water it runs right into the boulder and then it goes on the outside, directly behind the rock is the eddy. That's the back slack water. And then right immediately around it is that fast water getting forced back out into the main channel. And that little, I mean, it's not very wide, is just these little seams that are right there. And you, all you're trying to do is float, right? And this goes for fly fishing too. If, you, if you're floating nymphs, that's what you want to do. But high line it. Keep your rod tip up really high. If you can get your line to go from the rod tip to the bobber without touching the water, even better. Um, but just kind of, you know, tight line it all the way down, picking up any slack you need to and let it dead drift without any drag or getting hung up on anything. Um, and you can, you can waylay some fish on it. It's just a, it's a fun way. You don't technically, or you don't usually catch trout with a bobber when using, you know, non fly fishing equipment. So just something different to do. But if you are 
bait fishing. If you're going to be using power bait, um, you know, having a box that's just got some casting different, few different size casting weights, um, couple different size or a couple different types of hooks in here. I showed them earlier, but they're just some really small hooks and treble hooks, size 16, size 18, size 14, um, some snap swivels, uh, some pieces of split shot. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, and you can mix and match with that. There's no, there's no right way to do it. This is just the way that I've found success. It's been the easiest for me. Um, without taking up, you know, it's an easy way to teach somebody to, to fish. Trout fishing is a great, I, that's, I grew up fishing for trout. That's how I learned how the basics of everything I know about fishing today were built around sitting at a lake or, or a river power bait fishing with trout and then going to lures and then going to fly fishing. Um, and then it's just gone from there. So fishing with bait, super simple for trout. You don't need, this is all you need for trout. If you don't need a box bigger than this, you're going to fit all of your spoons, super dupers, everything we've gone through and your terminal tackle will all fit into something that's this size. So this is one of the smallest size tackle boxes that they make. This will fit in your hoodie pocket, your back pocket, easy in a backpack. This is all you need to trout fish. And then, you know, one or two things of your favorite power bait or eggs. Um, and that's it. For your equipment with trout, use forceps, not pliers. Here's the difference. Here's our pliers. Here's our forceps. Um, trout are very finicky fish. Uh, they die if you look at them funny sometimes. I mean, it's a joke, but they are not very hardy. Um, anything behind the front of the mouth. If you don't have forceps, cut your line. Um, if you do have forceps, if it's touching the gill in any way, cut the line. Um, if it's back behind the tongue or the tongue patch, if you can get to it with little tiny forceps and grab it and turn it without doing anything, okay. Do not stick pliers in a trout's mouth if you want it to live. This will kill it. It doesn't matter how you get it out. You stick these in a trout's mouth, you're going to kill the fish. Um, if you go to take a picture with the trout, Hold it underneath its head, not in its mouth, not behind the gills, just resting underneath right here. You're holding it just like that. And then back behind, just right in front of the tail, just like that um, to take any picture. Even if, and if the fish is small enough, anything under 14, 16 inches, just one hand, the fish right in the middle of the body. So half the fish, its tail's hanging off this way. It's head's hanging off this way. Wet your hands before you touch the fish. So when you're reeling it in, Stick your hand in the water. Now, this doesn't go for you. If you're keeping the fish, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, however you're going to handle it to get it in your bucket or on your stringer before you clean it is up to you. But if you plan on releasing the fish, best practices, wet your hands before you touch that fish. Don't touch it anywhere inside its mouth or behind its gill plates. Um, try to use forceps. Bar pinch all of the barbs off your hooks. Um, so, you know, these barbs aren't very big, especially on these little tiny super dupers and spoons and inline spinners. But if you catch a big enough of a trout and it inhaled it and it gets back there, um, you can save yourself a lot of trouble. These pinch very easily. All you do is just grab it, right? Try to center your plier right on the point of the barb. And then squeeze it as hard as you can and kind of work it to where you're turning the pliers downward, which forces the barb inward and you'll be able to just turn it over. So those are best practices for trout. If you plan on releasing them or else you will kill them very easily. They're just not very hardy. Our water temperatures, especially at the beginning of trout season and the end of trout season is right on kind of their natural threshold of heat that they can handle in dissolved oxygen. Right now they're fine. It's mid, mid to high forties, low fifties in some places. Um, that's fine for trout, but early in, early in the ends of the seasons is be as careful as you can. Um, let me look back at the questions and then we'll, we'll get into the, 
into the warm water stuff. Uh, species of trout, um, pretty much exclusively rainbows. Um, we do not get brown trout to stock from our normal stockings. Brown trout that end up in the water, um, which is typically only the Mountain Fork and the Lower Illinois, uh, is sometimes we get them from trading fish. So a lot of our uh, northern state counterparts, they have a tough time raising uh, hybrid sunfish. We, we are very good at breeding and creating and uh, spawning hybrid sunfish. So in the past, we've traded hybrid sunfish with northern states for trout. Um, we also sometimes get brown trout from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and they'll put them in the lower Illinois and Mountain Fork. But for the most part, our seasonal trout fisheries, you might see a random brown trout, a random brook trout, uh, just depending on who our supplier is. But that's that's not very common. You know, you're more likely to see one of our one of the golden rainbow trout, which is trout that lose the allele and they have a big yellow back and then kind of clear through them. They're not albino. They're actually golden rainbow trout, um, just a recessive allele. Uh, but you, you won't see brown trout get stocked, um, at least not very often and not from us. Uh, what is terminal tackle? So terminal tackle is your, I mean, most commonly referring to hooks and weights. So, Live bait fishing uh, or bait fishing is typically referred to terminal tackle. Um, when you when you're planning on catching the fish in a way that if you were to remove the tackle, it would kill it. So you're wanting the fish to swallow your hook, or you know at least get it back to a point where you're not going to uh, remove it. Which are treble hooks, circle hooks, um, octopus hooks. I mean anything that you're going to put bait on is considered terminal tackle. Now, in theory, everything's terminal tackle. I mean, anything that's got a hook on it can technically kill a fish, but that's when you hear the term terminal tackle, it's usually in reference to hooks, weights, um, and bait is what you use with them. So with that, I think that gets me through all the questions on the trout. Um, feel free to pop any in there. Uh, I'm going to move some of this stuff out of the way, and then we will briefly go through, uh, how to fish blue river for our warm water species. So if you fish down there in the summertime or uh, you've never fished it in the summertime, but you fished it for trout, definitely uh, worth giving it a shot uh, from middle of April all the way, you know, into October for sure. Typically the best fishing is going to occur June, July, depending on flooding. Um, if we've had minimal flooding and the water's at a good level, June and July, you're going to pick up the most fish. Uh, most of the river is spotted bass. They're not very big. Um, you know, your average fish is going to run somewhere between eight and 12 inches. You're going to catch just a ton of eight to 12 inch spotted bass, especially in the braided section above the campground. So that the area that's just north of Desperado Spring, all of that pocket water through there is just spotted bass heaven. And, I mean, you're some of the little pockets are only about this big in between little waterfalls and the way the water turns. Um, and you're just making casts into each one of them, pulling out one fish. You know, you one little hole has one fish in it. You hit that one, you fish the next pocket, fix, fish the next pocket. Then you'll find little runs through there that are a little bit deeper, have some boulders through them. That's where you start finding your smallmouth. Um, and there are some lunker smallmouth in there. There's not a lot. You're not going to catch. It's not like going to the Illinois system or Barren Fork um, where you're just going to catch a ton of six to 16 inch smallmouth. Um, but the ones that you do hit in there that are pure smallmouth, there is some hybridization in there. You'll, you will catch the occasional bass that is weird. You know, I've caught some where the back half of the body is spotted bass and the front half of the body is markings from smallmouth. I've seen them split this way. I've seen it just in the masking. Um, but all of the pure bred smallmouth that are in there, which are Tennessee strain that were stocked back in the eighties, 
Um, they naturally reproduce in there now. They are lunkers. I mean, they are, it is a quality smallmouth fishery when you find those fish. You can catch them, you know, all the way northwards of getting into, you know, potentially a six, seven pound fish. But the average size smallmouth in there is about two or three pounds, which anybody who's uh, gone fishing, you know, with uh, light action, medium light action, river equipment for smallmouth bass, it's hard to beat it. Um, you know, they're very difficult to land in there. They have the advantage, boulders, drop offs, waterfalls, lay downs, trying to get them in without breaking the line on a rock is sometimes an impossible task. Um, but if you can find four or five of them in a run, it, I mean, it makes a trip just to catch those few fish because they're such, they're of such quality. Um, but this is pretty much what I use. Again, I, I try to consolidate my fishing equipment as much as possible when I go to places. So if I go to a place like Blue River, I fished it enough. I know what is consistent. I know what, you know, might catch fish, but I, I want to use what I know is every cast I've got an opportunity to hook up onto a fish. And for me, anywhere I go, it's going to be Bass Pro, Squirm and Squirt, Tubes. 1.5, two inch, two and a quarter inch. So here's our three sizes. Uh, here is our inch and a half, our two inch, which the two inch is basically the same as the inch and a half. The skirt is just a little bit longer. Um, and then our two and a quarter. The two and a quarter is substantially bigger in the body. So you can actually put a bigger jig head in there if you wanted to. Um, Bass Pro also makes a squirm and squirt head that are made for these. They look like this big piece of lead that runs through. I like these as opposed to a standard ball jig head, Ned head, anything, you know, that's not a full body, like the shank has lead on it or tungsten or whatever you're using. Um, what this does for tubes is that, so how you rig these, you just go in, it's internally rigged. So take the eye hole, stick the eye hole right in the opening. So it's perpendicular and then just turn it and then just work the plastic up. And when it gets down to the end, you'll feel it. And then that just pull the plastic and it, the eye hole pops right through. So it's internally weighted, uh, but having that weight down the entirety of the hook shank when you hold it they can't tear it up as easily if you only had a ball head on there or a net head where the jig the actual lead is way up here and all of this body just goes to the hook shank they just tear it up because they can they can really press it in this allows you get a little bit extra life out of them this is my go-to it doesn't matter where i'm fishing uh if i'm fishing a clearwater creek anywhere in america this is the first thing that's hitting the water. Um, I like starting out with the inch and a half because it's going to, it's going to hit all of your pan fish. So anything from all your sunfish species, rock bass, warmouth, crappie. Um, these actually surprisingly catch a lot of channel catfish um, in the summer months. Just throw standing up on top of a waterfall and casting straight downstream, let it fall down to the bottom and just, slowly pick the rod up so just this thing just glides up off the bottom and what's great about tubes is they mimic everything um this is going to mimic a bait fish a crawfish uh, a frog these are just so versatile and my color of choice is on these two and a quarter it's green pumpkin with red flake with the two inch and the inch and a half it's green pumpkin with red and black flake um, I don't know, for whatever reason, the two smaller sizes have black flake mixed in and these ones actually have the black flake in them, but it's just packaged as green pumpkin, red flake. This is my go-to. I, I feel the, they come in a little package. That's like this, just a little plastic package. I will buy one, one pack. It's usually like a, I think it's a 15 pack of the jig heads, 32nd ounce, 16 ounce nothing smaller, nothing bigger. Uh, I will start out with the 32nd ounce in this tube. Um, just so I can, when I get on the water, I just want to catch a bunch of fish to start. 
Uh, so when I typically I start out right above Desperado Springs, I pop in right where I said that really where that waterfall kind of comes in. Um, and that's good trout fishing. That's my starting point. I fish that little run that comes in because in those same spots where you can pick up trout every now and then there's one or two really good smallmouth in that first hole right there. And then all the water up through there is mostly going to be spotted bass and sunfish. Um, there's a couple of good boulder runs the farther into that braided water you get before it opens back up into the big, long, deep runs. And I have found some good lines of two or three smallmouth in a run. Um, but it's mostly just picking off, you know, a hundred spotted bass that are all that big or sunfish that are that big. Um, but I stick with this. Like I literally just a pack of these. Now this is kind of my little take anywhere box creeks, ponds. I just take this with me. I've got my tubes. I've got, uh, some little baby shad. Uh, these are Bobby Garland brand. Um, and then I got just a little sassy shad on a road runner. Just keep that in there. Couple, few different size hooks. So some different size octopus hooks so I can drop shot or wacky rig if I want to. Few different jig head sizes of my squirm and squirt heads. And then just some basic round ball jig heads for the baby shad. And then these are uh, Z-Man Finesse TRDs. It's just a stick worm. Uh, so again, same kind of color that's in their brand. It's called California craw, but green pumpkin with red in it, green pumpkin with black in it. That's really your go-to color. Um, and then I have, you know, some Ned head rigs and I can, I can put the Ned head rig. One way you can rig, uh, these tubes with the Ned head rig is you'll take get one of the little ones. So their sizes on uh, the Z-Man net heads, they're a little funky. It's like a one-fifth, a one-tenth, a one-fifteenth as, you know, your more traditional sizes are a quarter, an eighth, uh, you know, using what you see on a tape measure. But anyways, it doesn't make much of a difference. So you got a little head like this. So again, you run the risk of you can get the body chewed up but you can kind of fish these a little bit different because that net head pulls you straight down to the bottom. So this is better if you want to really just bang it along the bottom like a crawfish. But what's nice about these is on the hook shank, you'll notice that little piece of metal that props off right there. So on a tube like this, if I was to just put this jig head up into the tube and it didn't have that little bait holding clip, it would just fall right down if I didn't want to go inside of it but I don't want to go inside of it with the net head because you don't have to. So what's great about it is instead of going up and rigging it like that, where it's susceptible to getting banged on anyways, I want the actual metal head to be hitting the bottom. So what you do is go to the top with your hook point and pop it right through dead center on the top and then work it up the hook shank without piercing the body of the bait. So you want that hook point coming out right at the bottom where the skirt is. So it's not going through any of the plastic. And when you get it up like that on a typical jig head like this, if you did it and it didn't have that hook, it's going to slide right down on that bait little holder clip. So what you do is just press your thumb in and that's it. And you'll notice just a little bit of a bow in it and it sticks to it. Also, you can fish the tubes with this. Um, I don't very often because there's not much of a need, but the one thing with small mouth, especially the bigger ones that are in there is this is a sturdier hook. It's a little bit thicker wire than something like this. So hasn't happened to me very often, but you can straighten one of these hooks out. You know, you get a big one, you hook into a four pound small mouth in there that goes crazy you got a better chance of holding on to it with this than you do with one of those. But I feel like you have a better hookup rate of actually getting bit um, when using the smaller profiles. And then with your, you could do the same thing with the little stick worm. Um, just run it, you know, right through. There's some, a bunch of weedless jig heads in here. Um, 
So just like that, you just rig it, go up, and you'd pull it out. And on these little Z-Man ones, they actually have a little slit right there that kind of shows you where the hook point is supposed to come out. Or you could drop shot it. Um, Blue River, not really necessary because you're going to get snagged more often than not. You're going to throw it into one of the hole openings in the shoal bottom. Um, but what you can do instead of drop shotting it is just wacky rig it. So you take your little stick worm, little, you know, some type of octopus hook, drop shot hook, just something that's, that's open, you know, big, big wide gap where your hook point is parallel with your hook's shank. It's not pointing back in at it and just run it right through the middle of the bait and out through the top. And you would just put one, one piece of split shot about eight inches up above your hook and just cast it out and just let it flutter down and pick it back up, pick up your slack, let it flutter down and just keep kind of jigging it in. If you, if you wanted to get that complex, but honestly in blue river, a grub or a tube, um, I'll show you the grubs that are pretty tried and true in there. But like I said, just like trout fishing, I can walk all of blue river with something that fits right into my pocket. Um, which that's really all you, that's really all you want to take on a day on the river. Cause you don't want to become, you know, a bunch of cumbersome, um, deals that you have. Let me get the jig box. And then we'll just run through kind of the other lures that you can use really quick just to show you. But really, like I said, there's no need to use anything other than those tubes uh, or where is the grub? or something like this. So this is, you know, a pretty big grub. I mean, it's looking four or five inch grub. Um, but the main uh, or a big portion of the diet of your predators in that river are going to be long air sunfish or bluegill um, or green sunfish. So something that's kind of a root beer or different brands have different colors. But most of the time, this kind of color for most of the major brands is called root beer. And it could have, you know, this one has like green and black flake some of them have green and red flake but if this is your base color you could go with the standard single tail grub you could go with a twin tail grub or you could go with like a skirted twin tail grub but this you see the color base this is your color base right here you can stray from it a little bit and get away with it you know and still get bit fairly consistently. Um, but with all these, all you're using is just a standard jig head of any kind. I like uh, these stinger jig heads. It gives me a little bit of an, kind of an offset at the end. And with, with grubs, the way you want to rig these is you go right through the nose and you want to come right down the seam down almost. There's kind of a little buffer zone in between the tail and the rib section i usually come out like maybe two or three ribs up above that buffer so that it'll sit kind of flush um always make sure that so there's your grubs or your twin tail grubs or anything they're going to have two seams and the one's going to be on the back side that is the bottom so the fat part of the tail and then the tail tip when it curls up that's the other seam that's the seam you want to go through. So your grub should look like that. Hook point and tail point are both same direction. Fish, fish this just so the tubes that we talked about in these, fish them just like we talked about everything from trout. Cross current anywhere to straight up stream, depending on how much flow there is, slow, steady retrieve. Now with bass fishing, you can pop it occasionally, um, especially with the tubes. What I like to do just to make sure I'm staying off the bottom and staying out of snags is as I'm retrieving the tube. So you can see, I got, got my favorite tied on right there already. But if I was fishing as I'm retrieving, it's kind of hard to see, but just, I mean, this is as much of a pop as I'm doing as I'm reeling. I mean, I'm barely moving it just enough. And all it's doing with those grubs and those tubes is that every time it catches, 
because it won't do it for you're you're continuously reeling at a very slow clip. So every time you're kind of just it's a constant pop. Not every one is making contact with the bait because there's going to be just that little bit of slack on every pop. But the ones where you are on contact, your little tube is, you know, swimming along and it just kind of darting back and forth. But every now and then as you're doing that, it gives it just kind of one extra little hop. But for the most part, it's just kind of swimming in. And again, very versatile. Your grubs, your twin tail grubs. Now your twin tail grubs, you can jig up off the bottom and get more of a crawfish imitation if you wanted it. Your grub is standard bait fish. So with these, straight retrieve all the way in. Just, um, you know, and in the warmer months, you can burn those. If I always fish pretty slow. Um, try to stay up off the bottom, but as slow as I can physically go. Uh, but with the, with the grubs, if you want to burn them through some of those, sometimes below the waterfalls, you'll get small mouth that'll just kind of sit up where there's like a little hump because you'll notice where all the, you know, flooding is moved around the bottom and every now and then you'll find some gravel and the gravel bar will kind of pick up and those small mouth will kind of sit right underneath them. And if you tear one of those right back into you, they'll run right up those gravel bars and hit them, but they'll only do it if you're burning it. If they can see it the whole way, you'll get a lot of follows. And again, that just comes from a steady retrieve gives the fish a ton of time to look at it because it's not making any erratic motion. So with grubs in there, you're better off fishing it at a little faster clip if you're just going to straight retrieve. There's some other stuff that you can throw. I mean, crawfish imitation, mud bugs, all of, you know, different brands, different packaging, but you're looking for ribbed with lots of appendages. Same deal, throw a jig head on them. If you wanted to throw like a chatterbait or a bladed jig head. I stay away from the heavy artillery in Blue River because you're just asking to lose money. Um, there's just so many snags and especially in the warm water, because you don't need to wear waders, you can wear swimming trunks, you can wear just, you know, pants that you don't mind getting wet. Um, but when you're doing that, you oftentimes fish areas that are going to be above your head just for a little bit. And you're jigging through that work in the boulders. You just put them underneath it. So those little squirming squirts um, or little tubes, little grubs, I mean, for 10 bucks, you can get more equipment than you can lose in a summer out there. So that's really the, the most advantageous way to go. Not only is our, do I think that it's the best way to catch fish, it's also the most practical and cost efficient way to catch fish. Um, here's another kind of river box. Again, we just cross and, but still pretty, pretty common natural colors. You can fish them. Jig, really no need to get away from a jig head, but if you wanted to throw them on an offset hook and put a bullet weight and Texas rig it, you can do that. But again, the more weight, the more hook, you're just asking for snags out there. Um, yeah, these are just more bladed jigs. Um, we got here's some. Here's kind of a full body tube that's just got a few appendages off the back. You can, you kind of get the theme. I mean, basically you're looking for small soft plastics and jig heads in some type of green pumpkin base um, with red and black, blue and green, purple and green, just that's your base. Um, lots of appendages with, you know, no more than, probably a 16th ounce jig head because even in the deeper holes, just allow it more time to sink to the bottom, leave your bail open, let it sink. Uh, again, you get in with the eighth ounce and above, even when you're jigging across the bottom, you find one of those holes in the shoal or it's just enough weight that, you know, instead of it dragging up over a boulder, it's enough to, you know, grab into one of those crevices and get snagged. So 16th ounces, I, I feel is the best weight that you can use for all types of fishing on Blue River, no matter the species. Um, oh, here's a here's a big grub box. You probably catch fish on every single one of those grubs. 
But if it was me, I would be sticking towards more of my brown, this kind of yellow. And then, you know, if the water's super clear, uh, you might run a white or a chartreuse and burn it really fast and just see what gives it attention. But usually not necessary. But those are options. Uh, I hate to even say use hard. I hate to even show hard baits because it's just like throwing money into a garbage disposal. But uh, if you are very floating, floating jerk baits, maybe. I've never used these in Blue River. I know they will catch fish, but I also know that I don't like losing, you know, 10 bucks, 12 bucks into the back of a rock. But if you were going to use a hard bait in one of those, you know, waterfall areas or open runs and you wanted to rip a hard bait, I would go with a either slow rise or I wouldn't use a slow sink. I'd use a slow rise or a no rise jerk bait, something that, you can hold right in the middle of the water column. You you might, especially on the northern end, north of uh, Highway 7, those first big waterfalls, you might give these a shot. That's You're going to find some really big smallmouth up there. Um, you also can find some really big smallmouth down below Highway 7 um, on that southwestern parking lot below the last set of waterfalls. And then uh, from the Desperado Spring parking lot, the waterfall at the very end of that also tends, those are kind of the three areas that if you're going to find a giant smallmouth, um, those are the three best areas to look first. But never discredit any of those braids, any of those pocket water. Those fish will move around through flooding. They'll find habitat. They might end up in a place that's near spawning season. They'll stick around for it for a while if there's good feeding around it. You just never, the smallmouth around there are very elusive. I find them in different places every time I go. There's only two or three spots on the entire river um, that I feel confident that I'll find a smallmouth every time I hit that hole. Um, but there's not very many of them. You just, you got to just keep moving. That's why it's just a great warm water fish all day. You'll catch, if you're using one of those little tubes or grubs, you're going to catch, you know, a hundred plus fish every day. Most of them are all going to be spotted bass or sunfish that are six to 14 inches. Um, you know, sunfish, not that. Your sunfish are going to be four to eight inches. You might catch a fish that's around 10. There are some big red ears in there. Um, and then your spotted bass are going to be between eight and I say 14 inches, but odds are you're not catching a 14 inch spotted bass. It's going to be probably six to 12 inches and then your small mouth are going to run somewhere probably starting around 14 inches all the way up to you know 18 inches um are going to be your kind of standard size small mouth now if you wanted to get top water again it's hard to it's hard to lose these ones in the water but there's plenty of trees lining uh the banks but if you were to go with top water i'd just stick with standard like zara puppies Zara spooks, uh, Heden torpedoes, just something that can make some noise on the top. Um, very basic colors, shad, crawdad, ghost, bone, something that's like that um, for your top water. Uh, all right, I think we're down to the down to the last box now. Yep. And then the last one, this is... Uh, this can be productive, um, but again, because there's not, you know, there's some big fish in there, but like I said, there's not very many. Um, your smallmouth just, there's not a huge number of smallmouth, uh, and there's just not enough big spotted bass and big largemouth in there to really make this as advantageous as it would be if you were in a more bass laden stream where there's bigger fish on, you know, you're fishing the Illinois River. Uh, places over in Missouri and Arkansas that are just loaded with smallmouth bass. But this can be effective uh, to throw. Let me find a hook. And it's just using flukes. So you're going to use a four inch or a five inch fluke or super fluke on a three aught to five aught, just offset wide gap hook. So I have a caffeine shad and then just a standard fluke. So 
we've got our kind of our hollow body on them. And all we're doing is we're going to take a our offset hook. So three aught, four aught, five aught doesn't really matter. Um, you're going to take it. You're going to go right through the nose. You're going to come out the bottom. So the bottom's going to be the belly side, not the flat back. You're just going to go in really just to the point where it turns and then come out the bottom, work it up the hook shank. And when it gets up there, it's going to turn. So now we're facing the right direction. We're on our back and your hook point's going to go right up into that open belly, come right out through the back. And then all you're going to do is you're going to pull. So that hook point isn't exposed anymore. Kind of right underneath the light here, but you'll just pull the plastic forward and then just let it go. Now it's weedless, no weight, no nothing. Cast this cross current to about 45 degrees upstream. Let it hit the water, don't do anything. Let the current push it, just pick up your slack and you'll be, you should be able to see this bait. That what's cool about doing this, you're gonna see the strike. So you throw this out and you're just, it's a reactionary. What you're trying to imitate is a dying shad, shiner, some type of bright bait fish that has died. It is floating downstream. And what it's going to do is every time it's going to try to turn into that current and it's just going to whip back and forth, but it's weightless. So it sits up close to the top and just slowly sinks across. But it's cool because you actually get to, you'll, you can see this. So you'll see the fish come and grab it. Um, Blue River, there, there's not, the problem with Blue River and using this, there's not enough flow um, typically. This is great when you have a consistent cobble bottom stream that's moving constantly. Because all you're looking for is uh, when you get riffle runs that come into a pool and it hits the back wall and you have a really fast current, you're casting it into that fast current and letting it slowly sink. And that fast current is just whipping it back and forth, back and forth. Um, but you could try it in Blue River. Um, it's only going to catch something big. Uh, you're not going to be able to hook anything under, you know, 14 inches on something like this. Uh, now for your catfish species, um, like I said, stick with the tube or, or a grub. Um, that's going to be your clean, clean house with that. Um, and like I said, those little tubes, I've caught plenty of channel cats out there. I mean, I can catch a limit of channel cats in a day in on the same water fall sometimes really quickly. I mean, within 15 minutes, you can catch six to eight channel cats like that on those. Um, but if you are just going out there to target channels, uh, just a worm off the bottom, um, below any of those waterfalls, uh, your best spots are right around low water. If you go basically all the spots that I showed for trout, where you're at the ends of those roads that you've walked up and there's the big dump ins, all of those are good long runs that get stocked heavily with channel cats during the summer months. So they're just always loaded with fish. Now, if you want to go after flathead, and there are some really big flathead throughout that river, but there's some really good eater size flathead, like four to six pound flatheads um, that you can get into, you know, in the overnight hours, just right around the campgrounds. Um, you know, flathead are obviously most active in the overnight hours, especially with the way that that river works. Even in the summer, there's a lot of commotion in the water from people swimming. Um right around the low water area. So you really have to wait till after dark. Um, and unless you're willing to really get adventurous and put your headlamp on flashlight uh, and walk those trails up by highway seven or by Desperado spring and keep going up, um, you're probably just going to be fishing right there around the camp camping area. So your best bet is right at sunset um, go into just the little shallow braids that come through around there and fill yourself up you know, a bucket with three, uh, just take a little piece of worm or just take the little tube, um, that I fish with, uh, and catch yourself some live sunfish, throw them in a bucket. Um, and then once it gets dark, just take a circle hook, probably, a no bigger than a six aught, um, but really no smaller than a four aught. Um, that's going to be your pro probably six aught, six aught circle hook is going to be a probably best size. And then, you know, put it either put it right through the uh, 
that little kind of bald spot between the dorsal fin and the tail fin, there's a spot where you can just hook it right there. That's where I like to hook them. Some people will go through the lips. Problem with going through the lips is you restrict uh, water flow through the gills and they'll die on you. And for flatheads, you want to keep that sunfish alive and active. Uh, and you can really, you can rig it the same way you do with the trout. You always want a little, little bit bigger rod, but same deal. Snell line and a leader. You could probably just cut the cut your trout hook off and tie on a circle hook to that. So you got a nice strong 12, 14 pound leader and then put it on your snap swivel with a quarter ounce to half ounce uh, casting weight. Chuck your live bluegill out there and you can get into some flatheads. Um, and there's some nice ones. I mean, there there are some really big ones in there, you know, over 20 pounds that are swimming around. But you can get into a pretty healthy supply of two to six pound flatheads, which are great eating. So with that, I'm going to look over here at the, at the questions and uh, we've, we've gone, we've gone through the whole gambit of, of blue river today. So the whole, the whole playbook has been, been unleashed. So I hope to see some people out there this summer, uh, nailing some smallmouth and some spotted bass with me. Uh, look at any of the last questions Ask now or forever hold your peace. I'm going to answer these and then we're going to hang it up for the day. Thank you, everybody. Um, if you stuck around the whole deal, good on you. Uh, lots of information. Um, if you got the email for me to uh, for this link, my phone number is there. My email is there. If you ever have fishing questions, no matter what it is, uh, ask away. We'll try to get you the best information. Um, you know, we do these virtual courses so that we can have con candid conversations about fishing. I mean, our goal, we want you catching as many fish as possible. Um, that's my goal for every angler in the state. Catch as many fish as you possibly can every time you go fishing. Um, so everything we went through today, uh, this is the best that I know. And it has been consistent for me at Blue River for over a decade for trout and all my warm water species with everything that we showed today. The only thing that will screw up that river is high flow, both in the summer and the winter. It has a natural tint to it. It is not a true cobble bottom, crystal clear river, but it is on the clear side. Um, it's not, it, it's typically not overly stained. When I say it's tinted, it is a tint. It's not a stain. So use those CFS, uh, use the CFS link. If, if you don't find the link in the thread, you can just type in Blue River CFS near Connerville. That's our that's the USGS gauge. It's going to give you the best reading. It's going to let you know whether or not the river is blown out or not. You always have the opportunity to go to our website, go to our contact information and contact our two game wardens um, that are down there. And uh, we also have a biologist and two fish technicians that are on the property. So uh, you can give them a call anytime and get live real time river conditions. But if you don't, you know, if it's a weekend, if somebody's not answering, uh, you can pretty much deduce all that information just from looking at the USGS gauge. So uh, that's really, that's the only time Blue River is not fishing good. It fishes good 365, except if it is milky. If it got stained and it's running high and it is off colored, you cannot catch fish. Trout, I mean, you might be able to catch some catfish, but that's going to be about it. Uh, all your other species, they, it's just, they shut down. So let's go through the questions and we'll wrap this up. Uh, would be a good lure and spot for the bass at this time of year. Uh, the last reading I saw blue rivers at 47 degrees. You're not catching a bass. Um, you might, might, might find a small mouth below one of those waterfalls. Um, but if you're going to, it is going to be on probably a tube, a bigger tube, um, using like a three or a four inch tube on a eight ounce, maybe a quarter ounce jig head working one of those three big waterfalls, uh, one of the two, either the one that's on the very North end at the very end of, from the Northeast parking area. So the east side of the seven bridge on the north side, if you were to take that road all the way to where it dead ends, there is a big pool in there. I would try there. I would try the first waterfall 
on that road on the way up there. Uh, there's one that dumps in to the main run that goes underneath Highway 7. I would try there. I would try the waterfall below at the very bottom of the southwestern parking area on Highway 7. So you go all the way down there. I'd try below that waterfall. And then I would try at the waterfall at the very end of the road on the river, the loop from Desperado Spring parking area. Um, but that's, I mean, that's a what if. I mean, that's, you might fish, you might make a thousand casts to touch one fish. I mean, 47 is, that, that's cold for them. Um, you're really looking at mid to late March when water temperatures start to get back around 55 degrees. 55 degrees is going to be that low end of when you're going to start seeing some smallmouth activity. You will not catch spotted bass and largemouth with any consistency until July. Maybe June, but typically June, the river's blown out from spring rains. Um, so you get you can get into some really good smallmouth if you get your window just right at the end of March, early April, well before they're, they've spawned and well before we've gotten any significant rainfall. If the temperatures are right, if we've had all the ingredients in January and February to bring water temperatures back up to 55 at a consistent clip to get them there, that's going to be your best smallmouth fishing of the entire year. It's going to be that window. And then all summer long, July and August, you can wet wade the entire river. You will find smallmouth throughout. Um, and then again, later into October, if we haven't gotten too cold, then those water temps are getting right back down around 55. That's another good time to hit those big waterfalls again to find smallmouth. Um, but outside of that, July and August, you know, you, you're not as likely to, to sting one of those real giants in there, um, but you can find a lot more fish. Uh, and, you know, a two pound smallmouth is nothing to turn your nose up, especially in those little braids in there. They're, they have the advantage. Um, I, I lose, I, I don't land more fish than I land of smallmouth in that river. I'll hook a bunch, um, but landing success in there is part of the fun. I mean, you get them in those little braids, they just, I mean, they can go anywhere and there is danger everywhere for you as the angler um, with laydowns and rocks and shoals and, uh, you know, cut banks and root wads. And I mean, they can just rip into anything and snap you off like this. And that's, I mean, that's their advantage that if they go airborne on you, that's the normal way that they just go and throw, you know, most of the time smallmouth will just throw the hook on you. So they already have the advantage of that and then add in all the elements of Blue River it, really makes it for a special type of bass fishing. Um, but I love it. It's, it's one of my top 10 destinations in all of North America to go fish, especially during the summer. Um, and it, great trout fishing in the winter gives you something to do, uh, you know, 365 on that river. Not familiar with non-fly fishing gear. Can you explain open face spinning? Yeah. So this is an open face spinning reel or just a spinning reel. I say open face because some people are not from, you know, this is a spinning reel. They all spin, uh, but spinning reel is just a spool. It's open. There's no enclosure. So your line, you know, can get twists and everything on it. And with these, uh, most people learn how to cast with non-fly equipment on a spin casting, the one with the button, but spinning equipment. So you have your bail and then, but you got your line holder on your bail clip. So what you do is before you open up your bail, you take your index finger of your rod holding hand. So you'd be holding it like this. So you're just holding the line like that. And then you'd open up your bail. So you're just holding the line. And when you go to cast, as you flick forward that you just, the line falls off your finger. So when you go to cast, it just does that, throws it out. And then you can either snap your bail on like that. I don't like to do it. You saw the twist go up for that exact reason. So when it lands, you just snap the bail shut and then you're fishing. Uh, let's see. Uh, hold, which, which lure do you want me to hold up? Uh, the tubes or? 
if you remember, type in and I'll, and I'll show it. I'll go to the next question until then. How is smallmouth fishing during winter months? Slow. Um, on, on fly, when I fly fished on blue, I've had lots and lots of smallmouth, like follow a woolly bugger or a changer or, you know, any type of stripping fly. I've had them follow me all the way to where I could almost scoop them up with my hand where they're just lethargic. They're just looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. Yeah. Kind of slowly meander their way back into the pool. So like I said, 55 degrees is kind of your low end threshold up to about 70. Now in the river and it, that window is short lived because that water gets into the high seventies, eighties, even pretty quickly into the summer that also makes small mouth fishing pretty tough. That's when you really start to get into the sunfish and the channel cats and the spotted bass and the occasional uh, large mouth that's in there. Um, so the best small mouth fishing on Blue River is always going to be timing that window right when the water gets above 55, middle to late March, early April, all the way into May, you know, Hopefully you can fish, you know, you get days where you can fish it where we haven't had significant flooding or rainfall. Um, and then again, you get it as you fall back into it late September, into October, uh, even early November. If it, you know, like this year, it stayed pretty warm for the most part. Uh, that's going to be your best smallmouth fishing. Um, yeah, lots of people topwater uh, fish it and have success. I just, I don't find a need to. Um, anytime you add hard baits in, it's just extra carrying. I don't like to take a backpack with me because I wet weight it. So typically I'll be wearing, uh, you know, some type of fishing shirt where I have pockets up top. And like I said, I don't use anything anymore other than those squirm and squirt tubes. So I'll take all three sizes of them, pre-rig them, throw them back into the packaging they came in. And then that fits into my pocket with my nippers. And then I'll have, you know, pliers either on my wrist or on my, belt loop or something like that and that's all i carry so i just don't take a lot of hard baits in there but if people do have success with top water now with the top water um you know fishing around those waterfalls the big slack water around those boulders where you can get fish to come up and ambush obviously low light last light um are going to be your best opportunities but uh probably sticking with you know your stick your spooks and Zara puppies and, um, you know, walking dogs and, and everything else, propeller baits. Those are going to be kind of your primary. You could go with a popper. It's just kind of sometimes it's hard to fish a popper in moving water. Those, uh, those walking dogs. So Heaton makes, you know, they have the spook is the biggest model then the Zara puppy, then the heat, then the torpedo. And it's kind of all the same bait just in different sizes down. And then the, the torpedo's got the propeller on the back, so you can fish it a couple of different ways. But those are going to be your best bets for top water on traditional gear. Uh, if you're fly fishing, I mean, during the summer months, you could throw big hoppers, big stone flies. You probably you can get a lot of rises out of there. Um, but the farther that it gets into summer, you're really looking, you know, when the water heats up, you're looking for all the shady areas, the cut banks. There's plenty of trees, so finding shade on the river is not difficult. You know, the, the water is only really getting hit with true full sunlight for 30 minutes a day. I mean, those bri the trees and the riparian zone and the islands, it's so tight in through there that there's almost never a time outside of some of those bigger waterfall sections that get a lot of sunlight. That's why I love that pocket water. And towards the middle of the summer, those bass love that pocket water too, because it does provide them lots of shade, lots of cover. It forces the water to move faster through there. Um, so it's more dissolved oxygen. It's just uh, a better environment for them to be in, in those summer months. So uh, your waterfalls tend to have the best warm water fishing early in the year and then again later into the year and then this all the summer months can just be spent fishing all of that braided pocket water um just flipping tubes and grubs or mud bugs or whatever you want to throw out there under every single log stick cut bank rock just fish them all you're and in a lot a lot of times you'll find a fish on every single one um so it's pretty cool uh 
Okay, this uh, the small tube. Yeah. Uh, where did those go? So here are our tubes. And I'll just put it over here in the chat bar first so that you can see it. Um, oh, yeah. Micro fishing. That's I micro fishing is what I spend most of my summer doing. Um, and I mean, technically, these little tubes are pretty micro fishing. But yeah, if you took in that works great with fly rods, um, the trout magnets that I showed the little inchworm, if you can cast those with like a. Uh, you know, here's just a six foot light action rod with six pound test on it. I mean, you put four pound test or two pound test on a six foot all the way down to a four foot six light action, micro light action rod. You could throw those. I'd throw the little trout magnet um, inchworm deals. I mean, these tubes are pretty micro fishing as well, but um yeah, my, you can micro fish it, but there's really not much of a need because the majority of your fish species that are in there, if you really want to try some true micro fishing, uh, like with flies or with those trout magnets, and you want to catch like shiners and chubs and uh, hog nose suckers, or I mean, any of just your random, weird, non game, really cool Ozark, you know, stream fish, flint, uh, or not. Barren Fork is a great place to go and try. Um, and then like Sycamore Creek up off of Grand, the Elk River up there. Um, but Barren Fork, we have two properties on it now. That's if you're going to go micro fishing anywhere, that's where I would start. Um, that's that's kind of your great spot. So here's our tubes. Might be out. What up? Here's our inch and a halfer. Okay. So here's our three different sizes. Again, I got kind of a glare up here, so they're hard to see, but the one on the left or my my left, I don't know what it is on your screen. Uh, over here we have the, the inch and a half, and then we have the two inch, and then the two and a quarter. And like I said, now the inch and a half one has a uh, hook inside of it, so it looks a little bit bigger, but... Uh, it's green pumpkin, red and black flake. I will throw the link right to the actual page where you can get them or see them um, and see what the packaging looks like on them. But you can find these at Bass Pro and Cabela's uh, all the time. I've never looked at an Academies or Atwoods, but they might carry them as well. Uh, here, here's the link. Now this is just gonna bring up all of the colors that are on there. So I'll just type in what the color is. So when you go into a store, you can see it. So there's the link to Bass Pro to those tubes. Um, and then on that page, it's, it's gonna show them all as the two inch version, um, but in store, you can find the inch and a half, the two and a quarter. And I'm sure you could search on Bass Pro and find them, but it is, uh, Packaged as um, green pumpkin with red and black flake. So that's what it's going to look like on the package for what it's labeled as for the color. And then I'll throw the, the squirt heads on there. And you can, you don't have to use these. I just like these a lot um, because they were, they were made with the intention of using them with, uh, using them with these tubes. So there's a link to the head. And with the heads, I go with either a one thirty second or a one sixteenth ounce. That's it. I think we're through the questions. Thanks everybody. You stuck it out for three hours. Like, like a high school lesson plan, but I guess it's with fishing. So it's fun. Right. So, uh, with that happy holidays, everybody hope everybody had a great Christmas, um, has a safe and happy new year. Um, we're all filled up on our in-person trout courses. Uh, but as we go into next year, we're going to schedule some more in-person ones. Hopefully we're, uh, through the, the heaviest of COVID at that point, we can do some more in-person stuff safely with everybody. Um, and uh, 
after the first of the year, we'll get our new uh, Ask an Angler for 2022 sent out to everybody. You'll get a you'll get an email here in a few weeks listing all of our 2022 virtual courses that we have coming up. But um, appreciate everybody for being on here. Um, we started this format during COVID. Uh, and I, ho I hope it's helpful. Um, I know it goes fast. So like I said, the email you got, or if you go to wildlifedepartment.com and go to our fishing resources page, my phone number, my email address, text me, call me, email me um, for the fastest responses. Cause my, my phone's always ringing through the day. Um, but if you text me or email me, you're going to get the quickest response. Um, I try to be as detailed as possible. So if you have a question about where to fish, where to go, um, I try to include, you know, maps and um drawing on the maps to kind of show you where it is um technology is great now you can send it right to your iphone and you can pull it up on a map but bait shops things like that um got any questions just let me know that's what that's what i'm here for um you know, hopefully get you on more fish trout and warm water hopefully you feel a little bit more comfortable going to blue river now um but we will have some uh, some summer fishing courses that we're actually going to do in person this year that we're going to do some stream fishing. So be on the lookout here in the spring of 2022 um, for some summer free fishing courses that we're going to do at Blue River, at Barren Fork, on the Illinois River um, to do some in-person stream fishing uh, for classes. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but I don't have anything else. I don't see anything else in the chat bar. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, it's been great. Hope you guys learned something. Hopefully get you into some more fish and you enjoy the rest of the holidays. Stay safe, tight lines. We'll see you next time.